To get started, my name is Caitlin Carducci. I'm the Vice President of Member Programs and Stakeholder Engagement here at US Soccer. And my goal uh, here tonight is to say uh, some logistic -y things and then get out of the way and let um, some brilliant individuals who have donated their time uh, share their um, incredible knowledge with you all. So just some housekeeping things to get started. I'm sure many of you are used to, you know, Zoom webinar at this point in our lives. It's a great tool to bring us all together um, whilst we are um, in different locations across the country. So first of all, the summit is being recorded, as you can see from the note. We plan to post it online um, on our Recognize to Recover website once we are done. Um, in Zoom webinar, as you can probably see, um, you are not on camera, so we can then therefore make sure that our, our panelists are shown. And if you want to ask a question, you have two options. Uh, you can raise your hand, or alternatively, you can use our Q&A function. Uh, candidly, we do have a jam-packed schedule, and we want to make sure that we don't um, get too far behind on a Wednesday evening and that we are respectful of everyone's time. So there may you may put a question in. We may have the opportunity to get to it. If not, we will collate some of the questions, um, and if there's any of those main themes to take on, we will um, definitely share those out um, in some manner, way, shape, or form, again, on our Recognize to Recover website. So maybe a question or two for each of our panelists, um, and that's about all. Additionally, for anyone um, who is in a loud area or has uh, needs some hearing assistance, you can get a live transcript going as you can see from our notes and then hit show subtitle and then you'll have closed captioning um, of our event. And with that, uh, as I said, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dr. George Chiampas, our Chief Medical Officer at US Soccer and um, let him uh, run the show. So George, all you, sir. Thanks, Caitlin, so much. Uh, good to have everybody um, on tonight. Thanks for taking time on Wednesday. Um, obviously, our Health and Safety Summit is um, the first of its kind. Uh, again, I think uh, U.S. soccer uh, engaging with our member associations, engaging with um, our youth players across the landscape. Uh, we know we've worked together in so many different things from our heading restrictions to recognize to recover uh, to COVID. And, and I think that um, is a testament to uh, the individuals you are, the groups you are, and, and the young players that that play our game uh, across the United States, which uh, undoubtedly makes us uh, a, a unique uh, leader in the game of, of soccer around the world. Um, again, we have a very tight schedule tonight. Um, obviously, our speakers uh, uh, are incredible. You can see the, the depth of uh, information we're going to touch on. It's going to be about eight to nine minutes per topic with, honestly, the leaders in their spaces. I'll run really quickly through some of them so we're not doing the bios when they're speaking. Dr. Holly Silvers is the international leader on ACL prevention in the world. Any publication from FIFA to uh, any professional league in the sport of soccer, um, Holly has written those articles. Uh, in regards to the specialization in youth sports, Dr. Niru Jaranthi is without question, our country's leader in this space. Uh, Dr. Beth Piroth is a neuropsychologist in the NFL, in Major League Soccer, and U.S. Soccer. Uh, we'll talk about concussion injuries. Dr. Michelle Karoulis uh, is a clinical psychologist who's going to talk about mental health. Dr. Tim Churchill is a cardiologist at Harvard who's going to talk about sudden cardiac arrest and emergency action plans. Dr. Rob Huggins from the Corey Stringer Institute is going to speak to us about environmental emergencies. He and I work together on our heat uh, uh, and cold uh, guidelines that are on Recognized to Recover. Dr. Lindsay Langford is, a, is our nutritionist for our women's national team, and so you're going to get unique insight for your youth players. Uh, load and recovery and match congestion, Dr. Rick Cost, who's our high performance director at U.S. Soccer. Uh, Dr. Holly Benjamin is a pediatric ER sports medicine uh, expert in the country, leads policies and guidelines in youth sports. He's going to talk about the most common musculoskeletal injuries. Dr. Sarah Crisman out of Seattle is leading some innovative uh, uh, studies on pregame safety huddles uh, to protect our kids. And then Ben Roper from Stryker is going to present to you some hopefully access to some uh, uh, tools that you may need as a club uh, or as an organization. Next slide. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Holly Silvers. Holly, thanks so much. Uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, George. It's such an unbelievable pleasure to be part of the symposium. Um, I live 
eat and breathe this sport. <laughs> I do work with some other sports, but my confirmational bias lies with soccer. So absolute pleasure to be here and feel free to reach out to me. It's my Twitter handle. You can email me. I have my email at the end of this presentation. Um, it's a quick presentation, a little bit dense, but um, next slide. But I think there's some good information we can share. Obviously, we know soccer is the most widely played sport. We have over 300 million registered players globally. Um, what I love, I've been in this space for about 22 years now. And this, I love this second bullet point where it's the second most popular sport in the United States now. Um, when I started as my clinical career, it was about fifth. So I love to see the growth in our domestically um, and love to see the growth domestically within the female cohort. Um, we have about 1.6 million female players in the United States. And if you look at the first US female collegiate team played, which is back in 1977, since that time, there's been a 1200% growth in the game domestically, hence our dominance. But um, I, that just is so exciting to me. And we've been the leaders you know, globally in that regard. Next slide. However, uh, unfortunately, we have injuries continue that continue to occur and in some cases increase next next. Um, so how can we mitigate? We're going to talk specifically about ACL injury risk. And unfortunately, when I started my career, um, I worked closely with Bert Mandelbaum. We, there are about 100,000 ACLs that were happening annually in our nation. Unfortunately, that's, near, that's doubled, uh, nearly doubled, if not completely doubled, um, in the space of 20 years. If we look at the high school data, so specific to ACL injury, girls soccer ranks number one with the highest incidence rate of ACL injuries per athletic exposure. And boys is just behind boys football and boys lacrosse um, ranked at number three. So there are about 43,000 ACL injuries that just occur in high school alone in the United States. Next slide. If we look at the ACL injury rate in the NCAA, it's kind of a pretty dim picture as well um, with women exceeding that of the women, women's rate exceeding that of the her male cohort by, a, by about three to six times, depending on whether we're looking at game or training practice rates. Next. And when we look at some data, Rob Brophy, who's a colleague, um, works out of St. Louis, uh, published this paper looking at what happens to these people after an ACL injury. If we follow them out within seven years of an ACL injury, 65% of these individuals are no longer playing. Next. And this is a pretty dim statistic. If we think about female collegiate soccer players, one in 19 will tear her ACL. So when we think of the average roster, uh, we're looking at one to 1.5 ACLs per team per season, uh, with some teams uh, domest domestically exceeding that. Um, very unfortunately, I've been involved with UCLA recently, and they've been averaging six to seven ACL tears per season. I mean, it's astonishing. It breaks my heart. And we can do better. We have data to, to help eliminate or mitigate, not eliminate, but mitigate this risk. Next, next slide. This was a study out of UNC and they basically tracked athletes that came into college that had already had an ACL. So uh, in this particular cohort, um, they looked at 35 ACLs that had had an ACL prior to matriculating at UNC. And they found that over 17% of them re-injured their ACL while they were at UNC and 20% of them injured the opposite ACL. So the opposite side. Um, now, during those four years, there were 54 that sustained new ACLs, so did not have an, a high school reconstruction. This was new. And even within that short time, if you think only about a four to five year tenure, 2% of them re-injured the same one that they injured in college and 11% of them re-injured the opposite side while in college. Next. Can we do better? Yes, we can do better and we should do better. Next slide. So historically, like when we started in the space back in like the late 90s, early 2000s, we kind of categorized ACLs by four risk factors. And those included anatomy, biomechanics, environmental risk factors. So considering cleat choice and turf versus grass and then hormonal um, situations, hormonal interplay rather specifically to women with estrogen and progesterone playing a role from a joint laxity perspective. Next slide. We've expanded these categorical risk factors to include medical training resources. So specifically in the, on the female side, what are their optimal resources available? And that doesn't mean just money, that means personnel. Do we have um, adequate athletic training, strength and conditioning resources available that are 
commensurate to what we're seeing on the men's side. And the other issue we have to now closely consider are genetics, because we have found there are some uh, literature indications that genetics do play a role. If you have a family member who has torn an ACL, your likelihood of sustaining an injury is a little higher, but those are the people we wanna pay specific attention to because those are the people we want to get from a prevention aspect. We wanna get them prospectively versus being reactive and treating them on the post-operative side. Next slide. Um, and you could go through these, um, you, yeah, the three of them, perfect. There are three studies, um, two of which I've been involved with on the publication side, looking at what is actually happening when an ACL occurs. And basically the bottom line of all these biomechanical analyses of both men and women is basically you're, you're, you're playing a defensive role. And that doesn't mean you're a defender. That means you're reacting, right? So there's this element of the brain not being completely ready to equip your body from a movement perspective because you're trying to predict what your opponent's doing and it puts you in a vulnerable position. So the whole essence of prevention is basically preparation, right? Preparation for the intended outcome of the ball, of your opponent. And we don't wanna set you up in a position where you have to react and all of a sudden your head and trunk are doing one thing and your leg is stuck in a position where it's dropping in what we call dynamic valgus, where the foot may be in pronation, where you may be in a little bit of rotation. So all of our prevention efforts are predicated on the fact incorporating all of this information we have on the video analysis side, all of the other information we have on like the post-injury side and incorporating that and rewinding, if you will, and saying, what can we do proactively, prospectively to prevent the primary injury in the first place? Next slide. Um, this is one of our national team players. You can play the video. I hope this shows well on Zoom, but you'll see her in the center of the screen and you'll see the player in blue encroaching on her. She never makes contact with the player, but could we show the video just one more time? Um, but she's anticipating contact. Um, here you'll see again, striking the ball, encroaching, the player is anticipating contact. So you see that sort of quintessential drop in of her right limb, her kicking limb. Next slide. So we're gonna break this down um, into parts. And I took split screen shots. Some of them are a little bit fuzzy, but basically in the preparation phase, things look good. She's in hip extension, she's abducted, the knees flexed, everything's looking good. As this player starts to encroach, then we see things start to go a little bit of awry. So we see the shot taken, she's in a little bit of excessive trunk flexion, the hip is flexed, the knee starts to extend as the shot comes off. Um, then as the defender encroaches, you'll see her start to go into trunk rotation. So increased trunk flexion, and then she starts to move her trunk into rotation and lateral trunk flexion. And then we start to see the hip coming across her body in the, what we call adduction. Um, as the defender, and again, it's hard to tell from this perspective, she does not make contact with her, but the player is anticipating contact. She's trying to get out of the way of the right foot of the encroaching player. So she, her hip goes into further adduction. And when she makes that step, we see in the purple circle, the reaction time, she steps down, her knee is in this drop-in position, her trunk's in rotation, she's off balance, and that's where she sustains the ACL injury. So how do we prevent that? Next slide. So <clears throat> there has been a litany, like a really wonderful amount of research has gone into the ACL prevention or the ACL mitigation space. Um, I have been honored to be part of a few of them. We've helped develop the 11 plus in the PEP program, but there has been so much work globally done in this space. And basically the essence, the message is they all work and please use one of them. <laughs> they all work to some capacity. You can choose one, you could choose another for if you wanna mix up the monotony. If there's one little take home um, from my message tonight is please use one or many of these programs to just include into your specific club because they really do. Like on the low end, they work from a, for 60% injury uh, mitigation or ACL injury prevention. On the high end, we're upwards of 88, 89%. They really do work. The, the, basically the take home was you have to do them. It's a compliance issue. Next slide. So these were two of the studies that I was involved with back in the early 2000s. I'm absolutely dating myself at this point, but we had developed the program called the PEP program, which was an ACL specific program for females. Uh, um, we rolled this out in Southern California and club soccer players between the four, ages of 14 to 18. And we did a two year study and we, we continued the study in the second year because quite frankly, we were so astounded by the, the impact this program had that we thought 
this has to be a statistical blip, but um, uh, hang on, just hang on. Oh, sorry. So um, basically in year one, we had an 88% mitigation of ACL injury. The second year we followed up, we had a 74% reduction in ACL injury. And this is just a dynamic warmup. All this is, is about a 40 minute commitment per week, maximum. You have to do it two times per week, just plugs in, plugs out of your existing uh, dynamic warm-up. So there's no equipment necessary, no cost associated. There's, there's so many upsides to this. We wanted to make it as uh, plug-in friendly, if you will, as possible. Next slide. So the following year, because of our results, we teamed up with the Centers for Disease Control with Julie Gilchrist, and basically we wanted to roll this out like, hey, can this be as influential at the Division I level? So we teamed up with the, with the CDC, and basically, next slide, we found, yes, indeed it was. We had basically overall a 72% reduction at the D1 women's level. Um, and what's interesting, if we look at the very top of the graph, if you look at history of ACL, so those are the individuals we talked about earlier, the UNC study, those athletes coming in with an ACL injury, could we protect them through their tenure? And basically we found there was a 100% reduction in, non -con in contact ACL reoccurrence and an 80% reduction in non-contact. And the reason that's so important is because once you sustain an ACL, your risk of arthritis, early arthritis, is very high. Within six to 10 years, we start seeing some radiographic changes of the knee. And if you think, most of our athletes are sustaining these injuries earlier and earlier in life. You know, I have two, two girls I'm treating right now that are on the same ECNL team. They're 13. So if we're seeing radiographic changes, that places the plumbly at 20 years old where we're gonna start seeing arthritic changes in their joints. And that's unacceptable to me. Clinically, it's unacceptable to me as a human. Like we just need to do better. Next slide. Um, so basically FIFA was very interested in what we were doing here domestically. They had called in and basically said, what can we do globally? If you're having those kind of astounding, amazing results domestically, what can we do to the game? Uh, and really help all of the confederations globally. So we teamed up as a group, um, met in Oslo back in 2005, and we revamped the program and not only made it ACL prevention specific, we, we kind of cast a wide net. We're like, how can we prevent all soccer related injury? So obviously that's impossible, but can we mitigate risk? Can we mitigate all soccer related risk? Next slide. So we did this first study in Oslo in Norwegian women, um, girls soccer players between the ages of 13 to 70, to 13 to 17, and this is the 11 plus program. Again, these programs are free, they're, they're dynamic warmups, they plug in, they're only literally 35 to 40 minute commitment per week. And the results are so wonderful, 32% reduction in all injuries. Next, we had a 53% reduction in overuse injury and a 45% reduction in severity. So what that means is like, not only are your athletes not getting injured um, as much in general, they're also the injuries that they're incurring are much more benign. So they come back quicker. And so when you look long term throughout the cost, the, the um, longevity of the season is that, okay, if they do have a small isolated injury, they're going to be back, they're going to be available later on the season, mid season for you. Next slide. So we wanted to see does the 11 plus program decrease the rate of ACL in male soccer players. Next slide because that first study was done in women. Uh, next, we could just kind of click through. And we said, yes, there was a total ACL reduction in men's division one and division two soccer by 76%. And remember, this program was not designed to be ACL specific. This was designed to mitigate everything. So there's a lot of upside to the 11 plus. Uh, next slide. Here's, if, if, you, if there's anything I say, this is the, one of the most important things. Does compliance impact time loss? Because one of the most perplexing things to me as a parent and as a clinician, as a PT, as a biomechanist is, why isn't everyone using this? <laughs> why do we not have better buy-in? And what we find, the more you use the program, basically the lower injury rate and the lower time loss due to injury. So it, basically the magic number is two times per week. You have to do it twice per week. If you do, you will reap the benefit of lower injury rate, lower severity injury. Also, you'll win more. Your winning percentage would increase. Now, I'm not saying we're making better soccer athletes per se. I'm saying we're making them more available to you. So your star striker will not be out with an ACL injury. You'll have them available to you late in season or postseason. Next slide. Um, and this just, we, this has been, um, 
corroborated over and over and over again, like the work we did in the NCAA, Katarina Stefan's work in Norway and Canada. Um, next slide. So basically they followed 266 players, basically the high adherence group, the group that did the 11 plus more frequently, not only won more and was injured less, but they had significant improvements in their functional balance and decreased injury rate. So another trophy or another win for adherence and compliance. Next slide. So why is compliance so challenging? And that's my charge to you. I, I still struggle to understand um, why, what, how we can make it easier for coaches. What can we do scientifically to help you implement this? Next slide. I understand we, um, we obviously we identify risk and then we create these interventions based on the science that we have from the video analysis and the data, all the epidemiology, and we, and we determine um, these efficacies, but we need to implement better. And that's our charge to you. And how can we um, assist you in implementing it into your respective clubs? So our future directions, obviously we're always revamping. We're always analyzing new data if ACL risk can be detected in pre-testing. And that remains to be seen. Um, I personally think, yes, there are some uh, differing opinions. Um, I'd love to hear Nero's opinion on this. Um, I think the screening tools in their current state aren't necessarily specific enough, but we do our best. Next slide. Um, we want to refine the existing injury prevention programs in their current form. Just keep making them better based on new data and then be mindful of the brain. So interpreting information, remember it's a defensive injury. And this is true for the NFL, for the NBA, for volleyball, it's predicting movement. So we want to be mindful of that. And then also obviously providing equal resources to female athletes to mitigate risk. We don't miss, want this to be a resource issue. Next slide. So again, very quick, here are my, my um, contact information. Please reach out to me. I'm always happy to be a resource to all of you. I thank you all for coming on and I will turn the floor back over to Dr. Chan. Thanks, Holly, so much. I think a few quick points before we move on to the next. If you're in a youth club, if you have an organization, please be compliant, incorporate it into what you do twice a week uh, for 40 minutes total a week. And if you think about it, it's not just about ACL, it's about core strengthening, it's about balance, it's about strength in your core that mitigates risk in the lower extremities, uh, overuse injuries, ACL prevention, other soft tissue injuries. So without question, uh, probably one of the most important things you do as a club, as a coach, as an organization. Thanks, Holly, so much. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on uh, to Dr. Jayanti, uh, Nehru, uh, who's from Emory. You could see his bio in front of you. Uh, Nehru, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, George and the group. And I'm so honored to be right in between, uh, uh, Holly and, and Beth and some other great speakers, but I know those folks, I wish I could give you hugs in person. Uh, so if you can click this slide and we're going to, we're going to move quickly. And we'll, we'll stay on task here. I do have a, a Twitter handle at Nero Jayanti because I post a lot of stuff on youth sports there. If you want to follow it, our youth sports medicine program is focused on young athletes, but we also partner with organizations like coach safely to keep them, to keep them healthy. And that's part of our goal for my talk. Next slide. Uh, and you can click through to keep on the slide here. So, you know, I've been asked to research this stuff for a while. We know that there's some risk and you can get hurt if you specialize only in one sport. But the question is, when is it okay to do this? And expert recommendations, including myself and many organizations tell you, you got to play a lot of different sports, which I may very well agree with. But I think we got to not just, you know, uh, say there's only one path to it. And so we should have a plan for those that decide to specialize. Next slide. And so like, you have to have a story for, for you know, this kid, George, this is George when he was a, a young kid over there on the left there. He's just learned how to kick a ball. And you gotta have you gotta have soccer available for that kid and still have a developmental pathway for George's friend, Jimmy, who was much better than him. So um, we have to have two pathways, I think at least. Uh, next slide, please. And then if you can click through this a little bit, this particular slide. So people start very early. Uh, with choosing a sport, sometimes even earlier than you think. And then, and I think we've actually progressed. So it's actually about four years earlier than back about 20 years ago, or even 25 years ago. And with that comes about four years prematurity in the type of injuries that you get. So we're seeing stuff in patellar tenopathy and, and other areas that, that usually happen in college athletes or beyond. Next slide. And so what are the health consequences of these things? Next slide. Now, this has been published a lot, and you know we, we are one of a number of authors now who talk about the health consequences, and, and is this really a public health issue about what is it, what's happening with this concept of playing a single sport? If we think 60 million kids play sports, and our data, about a third of them are specialized, so we're really talking about about 20 million kids, 
And we know that it does two things. If you can click the slide here, it does, it increases the risk of overuse injury, but, but I even think more importantly, it decreases opportunities. And that's actually, so that's an organizational issue and, and the risk of overuse injury is an individual issue. So I think you got to attack from two different ends. Uh, next slide, please. And I've been asked in all different uh, media to try to give an answer to this, and there's no single answer to this. Uh, but if you can click on the next slide, we can summarize a little bit of our data in this. Hopefully, if the video um, plays with sound. I'm here. And then Sports are a great way to keep kids physically active. I've played pretty much every single sport besides volleyball. I've played soccer and done ballet. No, I play all the sports. But more than a third of injuries in kids are sports related. Researchers from Emory University looked at data from 1,200 young athletes over a three year period. They found that for kids under 12, those that specialized uh, were more likely, about one and a half times more likely, to report an injury. When they start specializing too young, you have to acknowledge that their risk of injury and burnout is just higher. The study also found that kids are playing more organized sports, twice as much as they're playing for fun, which can lead to overuse injuries. So what can parents do? Delay sports specialization until their child is 12. Also, encourage more seasonal participation, maybe have a three month period where they're either taking off and resting. Another thing is making sure your young athlete is training fewer hours per week than their age. So if you're like 14 years old, train less than 14 hours per week. Proper warm-ups and cool-downs are critical. Especially as they get older and matches and everything's a little more intense, a little more physical, it's important to make sure your body can like keep up with that. But the most important thing is just to have fun. I'm Marty Salt reporting. Um, so if you click on there, you'll, you'll see a couple of simple rules that come out for this. Uh, if you click once, so the increase, there's an increase, and that's my son, by the way, <laughs> a few years ago, but there's an increased risk of overuse injury when you specialize early. And that's, uh, that's a known risk. Um, there's also increased opportunities for free play. And that, that's what we need to focus on too, is the unstructured play. And then the last one, if you want to uh, click is, we found pretty good data. That if you train less hours per week than your age, you're less likely to have a serious overuse injury and even any type of overuse injury. So if you're 12, you do make sure you're doing less than 12 hours. And that actually should include competition. So we look at these, uh, I think uh, we have, uh, you know, one of the U.S. soccer speakers talking about the clustering of competition. I think that's an important, important topic. Next slide, please. Um, and the other factor, and, and now it's great to see this an old, as you know, Holly brought up, but this is an old, uh, um, um, you know, New York Times article. But in, in other NGBs are worried about this: is this specialization causing a decline in their overall sport participation? When you when you take it off and siphon off only the best players, you lose a lot of the the recreational players and the kids who don't have the same uh, skill set or long term goals to be a high level or college player. Next slide. Um, so this is a study that uh, one of our colleagues, Dr. Champus, and myself, Dr. LaBelle, at uh, Chicago, and I was peripherally involved. But uh, Dr. Champus, you know, got a lot of probably some of you folks out there to have about 2,100 uh, um, U.S. youth soccer players complete these surveys to look at what is the risk with soccer and specialization. Click the slide, please. And amazingly, the mean age of choosing only soccer was nine years old. And that beat tennis, it's actually pretty close to gymnastics. Tennis is 10.4. I was actually fascinated with this. Next slide here. And, um, and there, there may be this relationship with more, not just single injury, but subsequent injury, two and three, three type injuries. And while some of it disappears with age and volume, it's something to note that you know, of all the sports that, that I, and I interact with a lot of the NGBs, a lot of sports, actually right now, soccer is about the lowest age of specialization. Whether that's good or bad or not, we'll have to see more uh, as far as attrition goes. Next slide, please. But I'll give you this. There are different models. One model is actually this, this concept of specialized sampling. I think it, it's not feasible to take a 12 or 13 year old academy kid and tell them you got to start picking up basketball and tennis. But I think you got to look at, you do have to accumulate a number of hours. And this, this football model or soccer in Europe, um, if you click the next slide here, shows the kids who actually accumulate more hours 
actually end up, uh, if you click the slide, uh, will end up at, at, in the elite level clubs um, and be more successful from a performance point of view, but not just by playing soccer, but within the domain of an academy, they're doing diversified activities. So you might want to keep them, and this is an argument I get where people want to kind of have them, um, they need them there because there's a business model, which I totally get as well too, and this happens in tennis, but we want their activities to be diversified and some of it to be unstructured. But if you add up the total number of hours, the ones that accumulate the more hours have the highest chance of elite level success and perhaps injury, but we have to focus with a lot of coaches here too on the performance aspect as well to a known risk. Next slide, please. Um, so we've decided that we can't just tell everyone you can only choose diversified sports. And, and if you play one sport, you're gonna jump off a cliff. We had to have a supportive model. So we published more recently a few models that we think might be helpful for those that do choose, which is many kids to say, I'm only gonna focus on a single sport. Uh, can you click the next slide? And so click a couple of times, there would be four little things. So we think that there's four main areas and obviously we can go to much more detail at a different time. And we can certainly submit this talk for you guys. And these are the four areas that we'll kind of run through real briefly, one at a time. Next slide, please. I happen to be the guy who specialized a little bit of the time on sports specialization and intense training. And what we found actually was those athletes with supportive environments actually had pretty good health related quality of life, even if they specialize. And those are parents who, who were not pushy about wins and losses. It was the child who was resilient and who actually had an internal drive. Um, they had positive experiences and they actually exercise a lot, which is a good thing, right? Next slide, please. We have a recent study that we're, uh, we just submitted for publication uh, over a few years and we had several hundred athletes. We looked at quality of life after different types of injuries. And if you click the next slide, um, we found that for the most part, except for overuse injury, the injured athletes actually had similar quality of life ratings to those in a general pediatric population. And so let us remember that sports is good. And even injured athletes, sports is good. We shouldn't scare away young female athletes in particular who have a lot of reasons to get hurt from playing sports. Catastrophic injury like ACL is a game changer. Overuse injury is, is, is modifiable. We can keep them in the sport, I believe. Next slide. Uh, now we have to look a little bit at uh, Sean Cummings data. He's a PhD out of UK, does a lot of work in soccer with, uh, with uh, the football clubs out there. And we have to look at um, this concept of biobanding, which is actually grouping kids by their predicted adult height and in, in quartiles, like either before puberty, at the beginning of a growth spurt, then the growth spurt, and then when they're skeletally mature, and actually grouping the kids and actually reduces their injury rate by where they are in maturity, not by their age. And this has actually been shown there. He's done an LTA, but particularly in soccer clubs. And it's been very effective. He's, a, he's got a big, I'm all on board with this concept of biobanding and actually grouping your um, 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 recommendations of training by their developmental stage. Next slide. Uh, my new colleague here, Dr. Greg Meyer, who's one of the best Holly Silvers and others know him quite well, looks at biomechanical deficits. And here's George at his, one of his birthday parties when he's younger. He's right there in the blue shirt. And, and let's not forget this true concept of adolescent awkwardness uh, that happens during your peak height or growth phase. Next slide, please. So we have to make changes. And we find that actually not only do you get coordination deficits that Holly well explained uh, that happen, but also it happens with overuse type injury as well too. So one of the things we got to do is make changes during growth phases. So you don't have to do a lot of sprinting, running, and rapid directional changes when they're in growth, uh, rapid growth phase. They need to work on coordination, balance, small skill set, and, and strength. And next slide, please. Um, the last thing is training load progressions and workload. Um, so if you tell a uh, high level young athlete that you got to train less, well, it's not always met with the best, uh, um, you know, response. So we got to be able to help them still. Next slide, please. And so we want to find that sweet spot. If you overtrain you can, and have high uh, rapid increase, you may have an injury risk, which is your uh, acute workload ratio. But if you undertrain and if you're not training enough, you don't have the resilience to tolerate the load. So you need to find that sweet spot where you don't make big changes, you have to work your load up. Next slide. And that's, that's a big concept. And this is, again, something we can talk about more, but if you look at the top slide, the goal is through initial exposure to, to high level training, then skeletally mature kids at the end, you can increase workloads slowly over time and build high workloads successfully so your athletes are resilient. And then they get a break when they're done with the competition. Next slide. We've uh, published, and again, we can send this stuff to you or send the talk. 
kind of like an, it's like an asthma action plan where we published this, which is kind of an, a young athlete action plan for when, you're, when your athlete has a low, moderate, or high risk um, uh, disposition, whether you should continue playing or not. And uh, in the interest of time, hopefully we can send these talks to the, to the um, uh, attendees. Next slide, please. And finally, my last plug is, uh, this is all, this isn't just sports specialization, this is athlete development. And, and I think that's where sports specialization fits in. So if you're interested, follow me on Twitter. I'm gonna do a, a, a big Zoom webinar, I think this Saturday at 10 through the LTAD network. Am I allowed to plug that? It's great for coaches and, and those in performance world uh, who wanna talk about this in more detail. Next slide. So just remember the components of what it takes to train an athlete, what you do during growth periods, and free play, let the kids play when they can. Next slide. Thank you so much. You can click through, see my kids and family, and I have to thank them every time I give a talk or leave town. So thank you all, and thank you, George, for inviting me in U.S. soccer. Dr. Jayanti, first of all, uh, absolutely fascinating and following um, um, what, what Dr. Silver shared with, with us. Our, our goal as coaches and clubs, uh, parents, referees, is, is to really make sure that our, our young players uh, are optimal in, in their ability to play the game. And I think one of the points you said is, is for them to stay in the game. Um, the worst thing is for these young players to have a catastrophic injury and then stop playing, stop uh, enjoying sport. Um, and between your talk and, and Dr. Silver's talk, um, outstanding, outstanding uh, information for our coaches and, and clubs. Um, I will reiterate that this is being recorded and we will share it uh, on Recognize to Recover. So, um, um, Dr. Jonathan, thank you so much. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and uh, shift gears a little bit. Uh, Dr. Piroth, who works at Rush University in Chicago, uh, her bio I shared earlier with everyone is on the NFL's uh, head and spine committee, is uh, our consultant with United States Soccer and NWSL. Uh, Dr. Beth Piroth, thanks for being here. George, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be with you all. So like the other presenters, I have a brief time, so we're going to go through a number of things. But I thought it would be really helpful. Come next slide, please. I thought it would be really helpful to talk about what are the key elements. If you are a coach or an administrator or a parent, what are the key elements that you should be looking at to have a concussion program? And there are sort of six main things we're going to talk about that I really want you to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So the first really is about education, and I can't say this enough, we really need everyone to be in, in educated on concussions. This means players, coaches, parents, administrators, and officials. And I always talk about we need as many eyes on these players as possible to know when somebody has suffered a concussion or a possible concussion. Next slide, please. And the reason for this is that when we talk about concussions, we break it down into two um, main issues. There's the signs and the symptoms. And the signs are those things that are observable by others. So this is why we want teammates to be able to, to know what a concussion looks like. So they can say to their coach, you know, my teammate over here looks confused. She's acting oddly. We want coaches to understand that, you know, they're, maybe they're talking to one of their athletes and they're slow to respond and they, are, they're, they look out of it. And so that may be an indication that in fact, they've had a concussion. And, you know, if they don't know this information, they are not going to be picking up these injuries. But it's also really important that the athletes themselves understand what a concussion is. When we look at the data about why athletes don't report concussions, one of them is that they honestly just didn't know the symptoms they were experiencing were a possible concussion. So it's very important that they understand so they can raise their hand and say something's not right. So this, the most common symptom is a headache. Um, but we also want to be careful that many of these symptoms are not specific to concussion. So we don't want you know, kids to be overly anxious and every time they have a concussion, every time they have a headache, it's a concussion. But if there's any significant contact to the head or contact to the body that moves the head forcefully and any of these symptoms, headache, nausea, dizziness, impaired balance, changes in vision, sensitivity to light and sound, ringing in the ears, and mental status changes, meaning confusion, disorientation, if any of these symptoms are experienced or any of those signs are observed, we really want someone to be pulled out from play to be evaluated. Next slide, please. And I can't say this enough. I really strongly recommend, recommend that you all go to the Recognize and Recover. Um, U.S. Soccer has done a phenomenal job of putting together really updated information about not only concussions, but emergency action plans, cardiac health, and many of the things you're going to hear tonight. 
So big kudos to Dr. Champas and all the, those involved. But one of the things that I really like about the recognizing recover from a concussion standpoint is I have this video and it, I, for time purposes, I'm not gonna show it, but I really do encourage you to look at it. It's very well done in that it's from the vantage point of the athlete and what he or she may experience. And I think that's a really powerful message and something that we should be sharing with the athletes. Next slide, please. And then one of the other things I recommend when I talk to coaches and teammates is to have someone that you designate to report injuries, because I can't stress this enough. For teams, we really want to create what we call an environment of safety. And what that means is we want athletes to feel comfortable coming forward and saying something's not right, right? Or saying something's not right with a teammate. You know, unfortunately, I've been doing this for a long time and I, I hear too many stories about players saying, I didn't want to tell anybody about my injury because I was afraid I'd get pulled or worse, I was afraid I'd be made fun of, you know, they would mock me and these things do happen. So, you know, it should be a coach or a captain or a responsible adult that, that athletes feel comfortable coming forward saying, you know, I, 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 I have these symptoms. I think I should be checked out. Next slide, please. And, you know, you probably have all heard this phrase, when in doubt, sit them out. And, you know, it's a really important thing to keep in mind because we don't ask that coaches and parents and players become many mental health, you know, uh, medical professionals. But we ask if there's any significant contact to the head or, again, blow to the body that moves the head with significant force and any of these signs or symptoms are experienced that they be removed from play because it, symptoms can develop. And we can see medical emergencies, we'll talk about in a second, but we want them to move to place so they can be evaluated by a healthcare professional that's been appropriately trained in concussion assessment. Next slide, please. So another question I get all the time is, you know, when is it an emergency? And one of the things that you, as a parent, you really should be asking your, your clubs are, do they have an emergency action plan? And again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, recognize and recover has done a great job establishing those for you. But, you know, not every uh, blow to the head is a concussion, and certainly not every blow to the head is also means a medical emergency. But these things do happen. Um, so, you know, the CDC lists a number of things. And, and really, the sort of the main issue is, are the symptoms getting worse? Typically, when you remove an athlete from play, their symptoms diminish or they stabilize. And so if you're seeing an athlete who is reporting that their symptoms are getting worse, the headache is increasing, they're looking more confused, they're looking more fatigued, harder to arouse, they're looking, they're suddenly having trouble speaking. This is an indication that they really should be taken emergently to a local emergency room. We also worry about repetitive vomiting. Um, not so much one, one time they throw up athletes vomit for a lot of reasons, but when we get, uh, you know, we see repetitive vomiting that can be an, an also an indication of medical emergency. Any loss of consciousness is of concern. Uh, any possible seizure activity, fortunately, that is rare, but we can see that uh, contact seizures. And any loss of sensation in extremities, that may be indication of a, a spinal cord injury. And so any of these danger signs indicate that someone should be taken emergently to the ER. Next slide, please. So another question I frequently get is, how do we know when some of these recovered? And you know, the truth is I tell people all the time, just like we don't have a perfect way to know when someone is recovered, we also don't, I mean, when someone has a concussion, we also don't have a perfect way to know that someone's recovered. So there's sort of three prongs that we look for. And this is the same, I will tell you, from the kids all the way up to professional athletes. But we want to see, one, are they without symptoms at rest and with exertion? And we'll talk about exertion more in a minute. But also, is their neurologic exam normal? And so we're looking for, is their balance intact? And is their ocular exam normal? Um, over the last couple of years, there's been a real explosion in the research telling us how much the eyes um, are impaired after a concussion. And secondly, is there any, any evidence of persistent cognitive deficits? Is there changes in their thinking? And there's a number of ways we're looking at this, but keep in mind that people can have persistent deficits in any of these three areas. So somebody may legitimately feel okay, but when we test their balance, it's still impaired. Or when we test their cognition, they're still impaired. And unfortunately, we still have problems with athletes not always being completely forthright. So we never want to go solely on an athlete's reporting. We want to make sure that we do have objective evidence of recovery. And I will also say too, you know, 
we don't, as I mentioned, we don't have a way of knowing for sure. So I will often say to athletes to, and their parents, these are the three things we look for. If, an, if a parent says, I would like to wait a little bit longer, have her continue some exertion until he or she returns to play, I think that's perfectly reasonable. We always want to make sure that everybody is comfortable, including the athlete, uh, before they're returning to play. Because just like a lot of other injuries, the athletes can have a lot of fear about returning and they have to feel comfortable. And in fact, you know, uh, it's safe to return to play. Next slide, please. So the other question is, you know, what are the steps to return to play? So there's five steps, six here is actually just return to play. But the first yeah, uh, recommendation after a concussion has been diagnosed is what we call relative rest. And I, I cannot stress this enough. You know, I know that if you talk about concussions, everyone will say, you know, you need to lay in a dark room and not think and not use a phone. That's actually not true. That's not what the evidence tells us. What the data tells us really clearly is the first one to two days after concussion, we want people to take it easy. I tell people all the time, give me a day or two off of school or work, take it easy, listen to your body. Um, teenagers love it when I get their phones back after they've been uh, restricted. But you do not have to be overly restricted. In fact, the data tells us that when people are, are overly restricted, meaning they are not allowed to do any activity, they take longer to recover. And when we start uh, activity earlier on, we see quicker recovery rates and a rather significant decrease in symptomatology. So if I'm seeing somebody and by day three, they're starting to feel better, we're starting to move them. And this is particularly true with athletes who are used to moving. You know, if you are somebody who is always exercising and moving and you suddenly stop, you're going to have some symptoms. So we really want to start early, low level exertion. So that may be 10, 15 minute walk, a stationary bike, just getting them moving. If they can tolerate that, then we start to increase the exertion. So we're getting the heart rate up. And that may be running, elliptical, stationary bike. Although I will tell you, I try to avoid the running. Running can be jarring to the neck and that can cause some headaches and other symptoms. So I really love a good stationary bike. Nobody gets dizzy and falls off a stationary bike. Um, and then as, we, as they can handle that higher level exertion, we start to increase what we call agility. That means increased exertion with turning of the head. Because soccer and other sports are not involved just looking straight forward, right? There's lots of stopping, starting, moving the head. So we want to get them out there, get them in practice. I will oftentimes get someone back to practice sooner when we start this, not meaning that they're going back to play, but we, are, we can get them out there. We want them out in the sun, out hearing the whistles, doing those you know, sports-specific movement without contact. So in soccer, that means obviously no heading. And nothing where the ball's in the air. I tell people, as soon as you start to do any scrimmaging or anything, the ball's in the air, you're out. But drills and other things where you're moving and running, we, we want to see and make sure that you remain symptom-free. And then, obviously, depending on the age, if it's age appropriate, we do allow kids to go back to heading practice and to scrimmaging to see if any contact will cause any return of symptoms. And if they can handle non-contact practice, and uh, along with their uh, balance and ocular testing being normal and the cognitive testing being normal, that's when we return them to play. So next slide, please. So this is a brief you know, talk. I know there's concussion is a very complex issue. Um, so I do have here my phone number and my Twitter handle. I guess we're a big Twitter group here at US Soccer. Um, but feel free, free to reach out to me and I look forward to any other questions. Thanks, George. And I'm sorry, I missed the opportunity to have any good pictures of George up here. Uh, yeah, it really? seems to be a roast George <laughs> night, but thank you for that. But Dr. Pirath, I do have one question. Yeah. Um, our, our club coaches are, are obviously listening in. We see a lot of, you know, pro athletes and, and obviously each return is individualized based on the individual, based on the mechanism, their symptoms. So we can never really say, oh, it takes five days or seven days. But in general, research with regards to return to play in the youth population, what is the average amount of time in youth players in regards to a return to play? It's a great question, George. Thank you. And I should have addressed it. So, you know, I tell people all the time, the data is very clear that generally most people recover somewhere between one to three weeks. It is not at all atypical to have symptoms for kids that last three to four weeks. Three to four weeks is still considered a very, very normal recovery. In fact, at the end of last year, the CARE Consortium is following you know, 40,000 NCAA athletes 
And it was very common, a high percentage of athletes took up to four weeks to recover. So it's really, really important that people have ex normal, you know, uh, correct expectation that, you know, I tell even my pro athletes, it, listen, if you have a concussion, you're not going to be playing next weekend, right? We're going to, we're going to um, monitor this. We're going to keep you out until we think that you're recovered. But we want people to have realist expectations on both ends. Because I, I will hear sometimes people say, oh, it takes six months to recover from concussion. And that's a little, you know, overwhelming and terrifying for an athlete. So we say, no, but let's follow what the data actually tells us. So generally one to three weeks, three to four weeks, but a good percentage of kids will continue to have persistent symptoms. But the really important take home message is there are effective treatments for those persistent, persistent symptoms. So, you know, if your child is still having symptoms at three or four weeks, please, you know, reach out to, you know, a, a specialist in your area to get those symptoms addressed because we don't want kids lingering for weeks and months when we know that there's effective treatments. Thank, thanks so much, Dr. Pirot. Great information. I think everyone needs to have an emergency action plan for head injuries and concussions. Uh, make sure they go through that process and that return to play process is one that is overseen by experts in that in that field. So without question, thank you. It is a great segue into our next where we're going to talk about, we know that there's a huge amount of anxiety associated with injuries, including concussions. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michelle Karoulis, who's a clinical psychologist who works closely with us at U.S. Soccer and so many other aspects of sport. Uh, Dr. Michelle Karoulis, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. George. Appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Um, first thing I would like to do is have you all take out your cell phones and scan this QR code that you see on your screen. This will lead you directly to a Padlet, which is an interactive website. Everything that I'm talking about today will be linked on that Padlet. So three things I really want you to think about. When you walk away, I hope you have a better understanding of mental health, a better understanding of mental toughness and how to put those two things together. So a lot of people wonder what is mental health and why do we need to learn about mental health? Well, we know that we are seeing so many more public conversations around the topics of mental health. So it's important for us to be able to understand some basic concepts related to mental health topics. Another thing is that all of us experience difficulties in life. Nobody has it perfectly as much as people try to curate their social media to show that we all have difficulties. And something that's really upsetting is on average, people wait 11 years to seek help for some symptoms. So what we want to do both individually and collectively is work together to make a difference and try to demystify some of these issues related to mental health. I really like the definitions from the World Health Organization and American Psychological Association about what is mental health. And if we look at this from a layman's perspective, it's really about the ability to move through our own lives to recognize emotions and to really be able to feel those emotions and cope with some difficulties that come our way. People who have well-functioning mental health can face some of those difficulties, identify their roadblocks, work through their ups and downs, and then also be able to talk to other people for help. So we manage difficulties pretty well, but when do we know that it's time to seek a counselor? When do we feel like maybe this is going to be too much for either us to handle or if we recognize this in our athletes? Um, counselors are really great at helping people through different developmental perspectives and different developmental stages. This might include something like going through an injury, which we've heard a lot about tonight. There's a lot of psychological recovery with injury, transitioning from one level to the next, transitioning out of sports, uh, relationships, family issues. So all those kinds of things counselors can help you with. And clinical mental health is the actual diagnosis, treatment, and assessment of DSM diagnosed conditions. So this is performed by a licensed mental health professional like myself. So I'm a licensed counselor with a specialization in the field of sport and exercise psychology. So when you're working with your athletes and you feel like there needs to be a referral to a mental health professional, try to find a counselor, a psychologist, a social worker, marriage and family therapist, psychiatrist who have specialty working specifically with athletes. And this is really important to remember when we look at the numbers. There are some really 
tough numbers to swallow. We know that over 50% of adults in their lifetime will experience a mental health crisis or mental health diagnosis. This also includes one in five children. So keep a really close eye on our kids as they're in our care so we can recognize some signs and symptoms. We know that in any given year, adults will face um, mental health challenges too. That's typically one in five adults. And this brings us to looking at the suicide rate in our country. And in 2020 alone, we had 46,000 people who took their lives. 12.2 million people thought about it. 3.2 million people planned their own deaths. 1.2 million people made attempts. So that is a huge amount of individuals who are hurting so badly and felt alone. Well, I want you to know that you are not alone. Your athletes are not alone. One month ago, almost to the date, we launched um, 988, which is the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. This is a 24-hour line that's staffed by the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So the 1-800 number is still active, but the 988 number can work via phone call, text, and the crisis text line actually is available for text messaging. So please, please share these resources with other people. You never know who is going to need it or who might be impacted by simply talking about this. Um, you might understand then what can we do with all of these resources? What can we do about mental health? Number one, just remember that emotions are not good or bad. They're just clues about how we perceive certain situations and how we react to cer certain situations. We want to start having conversations openly in public and private about mental health and wellness. And this helps us reduce stigma that's related to mental health topics. So the more we discuss this, the more we're in spaces like this, the easier it is for people to approach their friends, their family, their teammates, coaches, clinicians, other caretakers about their mental health concerns. Now, when we talk about mental health, we also want to talk about mental toughness. We talk about mental toughness in sport. It is talked about almost the most, but the least defined concept that we talk about, especially within our field um, in athletics and in sports psychology. So of course, in sports psychology, we want to define mental toughness and really look at what it means to individuals. The cool thing about mental toughness is some people just seem to have that natural ability. For other people, it can be developed. And this is really about having the psychological edge over teammates, I'm sorry, over opponents, <laughs> but working well with our teammates. And it helps us cope better with our own demands, better than our opponents. It has to do with consistently performing under high pressure and under stress. Now, the thing with mental toughness is that sometimes we think about mental toughness as not expressing emotion, as not dealing with mental health, as being able to manage everything that comes our way. Now, that's actually a myth because when we're thinking about mental health issues, part of mental toughness is actually the ability to recognize not only our strengths, but our difficulties. And in that, it also has to do with the ask of others to help us when we need that. We spend thousands of hours training our bodies. Let's make a commitment to spend an equal amount of time training our minds and the young minds of the athletes who we encounter. So make time to talk about mental health, to talk about sports psychology, and let's put all of this together. So when thinking about mental health, when thinking about mental toughness, I want you to recognize this quote from Mental Health America. Life can be challenging, but every day should not feel hard or out of your control. When things start feeling out of control, that's when it's time to talk to somebody and call a counselor. We are specially trained to help people. I promise you we've, hear, we've heard almost everything under the sun. Sometimes people are embarrassed or ashamed to talk about something with us. Everything is on the table because we are extremely dedicated to help people live healthy and well lives. And so when we make mental health a priority, when we put these two concepts of mental health and mental toughness together, we know that we can work together to decrease stigma related to these discussions about mental health, 
taking time to talk about emotions and we can do this both on and off the field. We wanna normalize talking about difficult emotions. It's really easy to talk about excitement and happiness, but it's not so easy to talk about grief and trauma and crisis. So let's start doing that. When we normalize talking about difficult emotions, we can help explain that mental toughness helps acknowledge both the good and the bad, as I previously mentioned. So dedicate some time to yourself, to your teams, about talking about sports psychology, training our brains, and this can help us demystify areas related to mental health. We had a question at the beginning of uh, the webinar that I'm really sorry that we have to address. The question was about gun violence and gun trauma. So on the Padlet, when I saw that question, I added resources from the American Counseling Association. I'm part of their executive committee, and we have an entire toolbox, unfortunately, but fortunately as a resource related to how to cope with gun trauma. I also added FBI resources and training related to active shooters. So um, I know it took a lot of courage to ask that question at the beginning of the seminar. So thank you for that question because it's actually a pretty common question. George, thank you for spending time on mental health. My information is also on the Padlet. Dr. Karoulis, um, first of all, thank you so much. Um, obviously, mental health, I think most of our clubs, especially with COVID, I think it became uh, a factor and, and something that a lot of clubs, organizations, coaches uh, started to recognize even more. Um, what their position is as a coach. Uh, it's not just about on the field stuff, but I think that they without question realized the the magnitude of their role, uh, especially for the youth population. One of the biggest questions we have as coaches is time. Uh, There's so many things that is put on their plate. We want to be um, uh, sensitive to, to coaches' time and kids' time. With what you described, uh, could you share a little bit of how you think mental health can become innate in a coach environment, in a club environment that really resonates in a, in a very brief way, resonates for our youth population, if you're a coach or a club uh, uh, in our game? Absolutely. That's a really great question. And we think about how we allocate time, especially with youth who have school and homework and multiple trainings a day sometimes and practice competitions travel so where do we fit everything in i think we have to make it a part of our training protocol so just like we talk about nutrition and injury prevention um, go to the dentist we go to the dentist hopefully at least once or twice a year it's like getting a tune-up and really assessing how people are in terms of baseline so what is their natural disposition what do your athletes look like from day to day in terms of their moods and when coaches see a shift in that that's a clue that it might be time to call in somebody with sports psychology training just to take an observation and help people i think tools like the padlet i think webinars can be very helpful and impactful and allowing young people to use technology to learn about mental health can be very good too because again some people don't want to talk about it in public and having these resources allows them to research it on their own but i think if coaches take the time to dedicate to talk about mental health training that shows the athletes it's an important topic and they take it more seriously so whether that is a quick check-in at the beginning saying let's check on each other on our mental health what's one positive thing that we can say to each other today that's something and also to say you know if you're having a hard time come up and talk to me let's work it out thanks so much dr Karulis. and i left the references or we left the references up there for everyone uh so please take advantage of them uh thank you so so much uh michelle and um you have a great night. And just for everyone, a reminder on Recognize to Recover, we do have our mental health resources. Uh, please utilize them. Uh, and I will let everyone in on, on something that uh, we are working with Dr. Karoulis and our staff um, in starting to implement mental health education in our coaching uh, education. So that will be forthcoming uh, in the future. Thanks so much, Michelle. Thank you. So we're going to shift gears a little bit, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about sudden cardiac arrest and emergency action plans. Um, we are 
never want to talk about these sort of catastrophic injuries or catastrophic events. Um, obviously, uh, there are some that resonate across our game in a global way, but what we do know is that in that field at night, uh, somewhere in Idaho, somewhere in Montana, that uh, these incidents can occur. And we want to make sure that we provide uh, the, the right information and the tools that you as a coach, as a player, as a referee, uh, how you can bridge survival in these circumstances um, uh, when, they, when they occur. And we're very fortunate tonight to have Dr. Tim Churchill uh, he's a sports cardiologist at Mass General in Boston and Harvard University, uh, one of the leaders uh, in the United States. Uh, he works with us and our national team players and screening our national team player athletes. So very fortunate to have Tim with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Churchill, thank you so much. Well, oh, thanks, George, and thanks for everybody at U.S. Soccer. I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is obviously a topic near and dear to my heart. This is sort of the, this one of the central things that, that, that I do every day in my research and, and clinical work, which is to say we want our goal is to number one to minimize this happening and then number two, minimize to, uh, to help as, as we alluded to here on, later on the slide, when when bad things happen, help make sure the right response is in place. Um, and so this is the as George said, this is not a topic that everyone, anyone ever wants to see, but the unfortunate reality is it happens. It happens in high profile cases that are all over the media with professional with professional soccer players. It happens in our local communities. And so it's something that everybody, it's on us as the sports community to be aware of and to help work to prevent and to work to help uh, properly treat when the uh, when when this happens, because this is one of those, this is one of those conditions where minutes, seconds and minutes matter. So this is so sudden cardiac death is the, the, the term that we use, which is can be labeled anything from cardiac arrest to someone. It gets sometimes it gets labeled as someone just collapsing, heart attack. Um, and this is rare, and, but this is obviously high stakes because this is essentially this is a this is a fatal event until it's reversed. Um, and for the people kind of from from a medical standpoint, what's happening here is the heart is uh, is going into a dangerous and a what will be a fatal heart rhythm until unless it is appropriately reversed. Um, and it's important to note that this is that a sudden cardiac death is unfortunately often can be the first manifestation of some form of heart disease. And in the youth population, this is typically uh, this is typically genetic heart disease of one form or another, and that can be structural, problems with the heart's electrical systems. There's all sorts of varieties of that. And this is a lot of what I do on uh, a day-to-day -day basis, doing this tomorrow is doing various forms of pre-participation cardi car cardiovascular screening, that's the PPCS, um, to try to look uh, in, in athletes at various in various contexts, try to look for conditions that would put people at risk for cardiac for sudden cardiac death, cardiac arrest. And we know that in general, we know that that reduces the incidence of this condition, but we but what we also know is even in well-screened populations, even when people get the, the best of testing and the best analysis by the, the, the most experienced practitioners in the world, it still happens. The best data on that comes from the UK, where um, led, by, led by one of our colleagues, Sanjay Sharma's group, they sort of spearheaded a national screening and, all, and the elite level young, uh, young soccer players in, their, in the various club systems there. And they found this was occurring at a, at a rate of seven per hundred thousand, and this is per hundred thousand person year. So, definitely not trivial. And it always it's the kind of thing. It always feels like it's going to happen to someone else until it happens near in, uh, in our communities. So our goal as car, my goal as a cardiologist, but what what I want is for the goal of everybody involved in all youth sports is to turn a sudden cardiac death into what we call an aborted sudden cardiac arrest. And the key for uh, well, what I'm going to argue and what sort of uh, hope to communicate to everybody is that the key for this is that it requires a careful emergency action plan, which is kind of going to be the subject of our uh, the, the next couple slides that I have to talk about tonight. So this is a this is just a view from a big picture. This is in the sports cardiology world. This is a, a curriculum document put together by some of my colleagues a number and published a number of years ago, and I show this just to highlight that the the in in our world and across and this is a similar uh, 
um, thing in, in, in many aspects, but in our world, the, the, the really the two key aspects to treating a sudden cardiac arrest and, to, and again, to turning it into a, to an aborted sudden cardiac arrest are timely bystander CPR, which is basically we want CPR started, high quality CPR started as quickly as possible and then continued as long as needed and then early defibrillation. And so those, those two are, um, th those two are really, uh, they, they work together to try to basically to have, the CPR is maintaining the circulation until the, uh, the appropriate defibrillation and defibrillation and basically means delivering a shock to help restore the normal heart rhythm. So our goal, our job as sports cardiologists is we are members of a team to work with all of you and in our, in our local communities, team docs, trainers, parents, referees, coaches, teammates, et cetera, to, uh, and, and in particular to work with all of the organizations that are putting forward these, that are organizing, um, that are organizing, hosting, sponsoring, et cetera, any form of competitive sports and encouraging people to have, not only to develop, but also to rehearse, refine, and practice their emergency action plan. So we can go to the next slide, please. So what goes into the emergency action plan? We heard about this in the great talk about concussions earlier, and this is just another side of a similar of a similar theme. But what, what we really want to know is have all of the have the key stakeholders, have all of the key information laid out. And, and really the most important part of that is have that in a in a way that's digestible for everybody, have that accessible to everybody, and have it be something that people are, are aware of have reviewed and practiced. So then when the time comes, it's not a thought process. It's not a, oh, where is the, where is the defibrillator? Where is the AED? It's okay, I'm getting, I'm, I'm starting CPR, you're getting the AED and we're, you're calling 911 and we're moving on this. So components of this. So documentation, we want in a, in a given, uh, in a given environment, we would, we, we would advocate that things be, that everything be documented. Who's there? Where, uh, where, where different things are, where can, where the defibrillators are, where are the exit routes if the, if the paramedics come, et cetera. If it's not written down, it's not necessarily going to be in people's, uh, in the front of people's minds. It's not going to be practiced and reviewed, and it's not going to be something that they can do without thinking about. So CPR training, not complex, doesn't need to be fancy, um, but we want people to understand the basics of that and. This is the kind of thing where as many as people, as, as many people as possible that are able to, to do this training and understand the basics of CPR is just increasing our chances for saving a life. So ideally, this would be something that everybody, certainly everybody, all staff member, people working there, but even I, I would extend this down to coaches, teammates, referees, et cetera, anybody in the, in the sport environment. So AED accessibilities, AED for everyone unfamiliar, automated external defibrillator. These are the machines that basically do the work of analyze, they, they analyze what's going on with the heart. And if appropriate, they deliver that shock that can restore the normal rhythm and get and, and save someone's life. So what we want is these to be available, accessible, easy to find and quick to get to the player. So this is a, this is a standard less than two minute time to player at 100% of training and competition sites. So we want this if this is the, a local town field, a high school, um, a high school gymnasium, really anywhere that's, that that youth sports are going on, that that should really be the standard that we're um, that we're aiming for. And we're lucky well, later tonight we'll hear from about a potential opportunity be coordinated via via U.S. Soccer to help facilitate that from because it obviously requires there is a degree of financial investment there. Um, so integration, other components, integration with EMS, emergency medical services. This is the kind of thing we, we always want to be sure, okay, if we have to call 911, how are they getting onto the field? If it's a stadium, how do they access the actual field? How are they coming in? How are they getting out? Can they bring the ambulance directly on here? And then I think another important thing is what's the chain of command? And this is one where I'll, I'll be the first person to say as a, I'm a cardiologist who specializes in sports, but if there's a cardiac arrest and the paramedics show up, I am stepping to the side and, and turning over the command of the situation to them because this is what they do all day, every day. And you don't want the, um, you don't want the, 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 the person who, who, who had dealt with a cardiac arrest once 15 years ago in their residency, you want them, the people who are doing this every, all day, every day to be, to be running the show and in charge. 
And then the last thing I'll, I'll mention here is practice, 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 and then also revision. If this is the kind of thing where you're finding you know, that it takes a long time to get an AED, it may be that we have to re reconfigure where they're located. If we're finding that it that we it's not easy to get an ambulance there, we may have to kind of come up with a plan to get it <laughs> to get better access. So practice, iteration, iterating on this, and then revising uh, as needed. So we can go to the next slide. So these are just a kind of a couple components, sort of building on the same com same components. We we've defined as steps uh, working with U.S. Soccer and other organizations as steps to success for this. And the first I'll say is just really, and, and this builds off of what some of the, my colleagues said earlier, is really prioritizing this. And this is something that we want buy-in from, and this really shouldn't just be something that the trainers that the trainer puts forward and kind of makes everybody talk about once a year. This is something that we want the coaches to buy into, and again, down to, well, to, to parents across on the sidelines. This is a quote from an athlete um, that we had, had been taking care of in my practice once. She said, best coach I ever had was the one who saved my life. And that's the kind of power that anybody can hold in their hands. So CPR training, as I mentioned before, really, there's no reason that any staff member in working with youth sports shouldn't do this. Um, and really, we should be, be encouraging it broadly for anybody else. Access to AD is also comfort. It's the kind of thing where when people get a chance to actually hold one in their hands, practice using it, they realize it's it's not that hard and anybody can use it. And they're designed to make it, to take all the hard work for you and make it as simple as possible. Connecting with EMS, and particularly this is something that we do routinely at big events, but um, in general, you want to kind of be sure so that, that that's a clear pathway. Practicing, practicing, practicing. And then again, the document, having this all laid out clearly in a document, reviewing it, revising it. And this is something that you want to be doing uh, on, you know, on a semi-annual, annual basis to make sure this is front in mind. Because when the time comes, this is, you don't, you, you want this to be reflexive, not something that requires people to stop and think. Um, so we can go to the next slide. I think that's, uh, that's all I have tonight. I just wanted to really emphasize these are things. This is, you know, for us as sports cardiologists, this is really as big as it gets, which is, we look for and we try to prevent these things from happening, but we can't find them all. We know that even if you give everybody all the fanciest heart tests that I can come up with, their bad things are still going to happen. So, which is why we, we rely on all of you to help turn that, that what would be otherwise be a sudden cardiac death into an aborted cardiac arrest. And that's, I, I think, the, really the most meaningful thing that I do or that I can be involved in in my professional life. And so I, I thank everybody for their help with that goal. Dr. Churchill, first of all, thank you so much. There are a few questions in the queue, but I, I do want to um, say one, a couple of things first, first and foremost. This is very near and dear for myself as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, U.S. Soccer has a hands-only CPR training video that's on Recognize to Recover. It is freely available. Uh, the intent of it is, is that every coach, every parent, every player uh, can watch that uh, and have that skill set uh, to be able to save someone's life. Uh, it literally takes a team to save a life. Uh, it, it takes someone doing compressions. It takes someone calling 911. It takes someone getting the AED. Um, it takes someone waiting for the ambulance to bring them in there. That video literally is about four to four and a half minutes long. Four minutes that you can show to every one of your players, every one of your coaches, every one of your uh, parents, and that basically creates a culture of safety for you. I understand that there are some certifications that coaches want to take, and that's separate from this, but that CPR training video is free to everyone, and so everyone also knows it's mandatory uh, that video is mandatory training for every coach and referee uh, for U.S. soccer. So we are very fortunate that we we train every coach, every referee on hands-only CPR uh, and how to use an AED. At the end of tonight's talk, we're going to have Stryker present to us, to everyone on here, access to cost-effective AEDs for your facility. Dr. Churchill, I do have one question. You talked about screening. There's a question um, and I don't think we can get into the details of screening and the, and the need for screening uh, for youth athletes. You touched on it with Dr. Sharma in England, but do you re recommend any additional cardiac testing or monitoring such as during preseason or return to sport following COVID symptom side effects, reduce the risk of cardiac related events? I know there's been a lot of studies that have given us guidance. If you can maybe answer that, that would be great. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's been that's sort of been the topic that's taken up a lot of the last two and a half years of my life and my colleagues. And what I'll say briefly is that we've really there's been a lot of work that's gone into this. We've really gradually de-escalated this, and uh, at this point now we're really um, we're, we're we're really honing down and focusing in the specific medical evaluation for people who had what I would call either a very significant and se and, and severe COVID nineteen infection. So if someone was uh, was was really quite uh, really quite ill and and or and I, I would highlight this as the most the most important uh, thing that that highlights to us is when they and the, when when people return to exercise and there's a variety of um, there's a variety of protocols out there in terms of gradually getting people back into exercise after their infection when they return to exercise if they have significant exercise associated or exercise induced symptom and that to, in particular are things like things like chest pain um, or lightheadedness dizziness with exercise those are the things that that really are prompting evaluation at this point. It's, we're really trying to go be guided more by symptoms as opposed to a we've as opposed to a post COVID screening approach, um, and which has been a gradual de escalation of our of our work uh, of this sort of uh, the screening type efforts uh, that have gone from the whole kind of kitchen sink of basically every test that a cardiologist has back in 2020 to to, to the approach really guided trying to individualize it and look uh, based on how someone is feeling as they return back into exercise. So is it fair to say if, unless you've had a severe illness of COVID or have been hospitalized, you do not need any cardiac screening. And then if you didn't have any cardiac screening, but you're returning and you're developing symptoms of chest pain, shortness of breath, then you should get evaluated. Is that fair? Brian? Yeah, that's, that, that's the perfect, that's the dis distillation of that. And you know, obviously the, when people, if people have been out for the shortness of breath part is tough to sort of say with, because they've been out for, they've been out for a week. Maybe they had, a, and if they had a significant, you know, if they were coughing, et cetera. Um, but we really say kind of chest pain, shortness of breath, that's really dramatically out of proportion um, to things are where we start to see people like that. And even in that circumstance, you know, it's, it, I would say it's uncommon that actual cardiovascular problems are identified, but those are the people that we sort of want to be connecting with and whether that's your, someone's a pediatrician or in, and then if need be kind of into the cardiology world. Thanks so much, Dr. Churchill. Appreciate yeah. it. Um, thanks for all that key information. Again, recognize to recover has EAPs on cardiac issues. Please go there. Thank you so much for that valuable information. Thanks so much for having me. <clears throat> So we're going to now switch gears and talk about, as it's summer, heat emergencies. Um, I will also, and I know Dr. Huggins will talk about Recognize to Recover as we work together with uh, Dr. Huggins and the Corey Stringer Institute on our uh, heat and cold guidelines. Um, I will just share this, and I know he will touch on this. Um, heat stroke and heat-related death is a very preventable and is a preventable uh uh, incident. And so I'm um, really excited to have Dr. Huggins, who uh, is a national leader in this space, uh, speaking to heat-related emergencies, EAPs, uh, for our game. Dr. Huggins. Thank you so much, George. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you all today. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to just jump into um, environmental extremes, uh, especially my environmental emergencies during exercise in the heat. Um, so one thing that I really want to uh, uh, make sure is that is understood is that the body must adapt to exercise in the heat, but we need to do so with great caution. As you can see, you might notice a few of those players right there. We had the opportunity to host the women's national team at the Corey Stringer Institute at the University of Connecticut prior to them heading to Tokyo. And we put them in a heat chamber in conditions that they would experience in Tokyo for the purposes of adapting their bodies, their extremely fit and already heat acclimatized bodies, um, so that they could better withstand the heat that they would experience in Tokyo, so that none of these heat emergencies would happen um, uh, to them and they would be at, the, the, uh, at a reduced risk. Uh, we frequently will put athletes through this and you innately as clubs are going to be doing this now um, or as you approach your seasons with your athletes. And the thing to understand is that your body is constantly adapting 
to whatever stress or environment that you are exposing it to. So as we exercise in the heat, our body produces, um, our byproduct is heat as well, and our core body temperature rises. The only ways that we can get rid of that heat is via sweating or losing that heat to another surface or medium or to uh, our surrounding environment. But most of what we, the most of the, the predominant mechanism that we lose heat um, is, is through sweating. So sweat that actually evaporates off your skin and into the surrounding environment is going to cool your body and actually allow your body to thermoregulate properly. I always equate this to uh, 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 an engine in a car, right? If the engine in the car is, is running too hot and cannot cool, that engine will shut down and or break. Our bodies are the same way. Um, just because we have fluid on board doesn't mean that we are going to not have a heat-related illness. Um, so those are big things, myths really to keep in mind. But the harder you push the engine, the greater the intensity of the exercise that you have with your players, the longer the duration in, in bad environments or hot environments, hot humid environments, the greater the likelihood of heat, uh, heat illness and heat stroke. Uh, next. So different types of heat-related illnesses are often talked about. Um, the two most common are heat exhaustion and exertional heat stroke. And they both can be uh, you know, serious and potentially life-threatening conditions, but heat stroke more so than heat exhaustion. Um, heat exhaustion is about fluid loss. So when you exercise in the heat, um, that sweating mechanism that we just talked about needs to continue to operate. If it doesn't operate, you're gonna just continue to lose fluids if you're not replacing those fluids um, adequately. Um, what will happen is you'll essentially fatigue, you'll stop exercise and you'll, hence the term heat exhaustion, you will stop. Exertional heat stroke is different. It is a medical emergency where your body is producing more heat that it can actually get rid of. And what happens is our core body temperature gets up to levels of higher than 104, 105 degrees Fahrenheit. The normal exercising body temperature is usually between 100 and 103, depending on you know, conditions and intensity. Um, and the most elite athletes can, uh, who, who also um, train in the heat are able to tolerate higher levels of uh, core body temperature, but that's because they're super fit. They have no underlying conditions. They're properly hydrated and they've heat acclimatized over a period of time prior to whatever event that they're, they're um, uh, competing in. So a common myth is that you have to have heat exhaustion first to have a heat stroke. That is not the case. These things are not on a continuum. Do, you do not move from heat cramps or to heat exhaustion to heat stroke. Um, you can be 100% hydrated and still experience heat stroke. Um, uh, I have studied uh, soccer players uh, at my university during preseason in August, and th within 20 minutes, I've seen athletes that have gotten up to 104 degrees um, just by virtue of going really hard, really early um, in the training uh, and, and on a hot and humid day. So what are your jobs as, um, as coaches, as club leaders and directors? It is to educate using the recognized to recover heat guidelines and the policies that um, we've helped uh, US soccer and George put together. Uh, you need to recognize and educate on the signs and symptoms because the, the, if you recognize them early, you will allow for the possible um, treatment, rapid treatment and rapid recovery of your, of your athlete. So what are you looking for? Um, I've highlighted some of the in bold there, some of the real key ones. Altered mental status. You know your athletes so well. You know what they're like normally. You know what you know their jovial self or or you know uh, how they act and behave. Um, if they're confused, if they're irritable, if they're aggressive, if they're complaining of dizziness, 
um, weakness, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, all of these different things. Sometimes even a shuffling of the feet that you kind of would see with someone with a concussion and then all of a sudden they collapse. Um, if you're in hot conditions, if they've been training for a while, um, these are red flags for you as a, as, a, as a leader of the organization. Granted, you will not be able to, uh, unless you have medical uh, personnel present, obtain a, a core body temperature for your athlete. But um, those are the two diagnostic criteria that we use as medical professionals to decide and determine if someone has a heat stroke. So if you see any of these things, you need to act quickly and you need to make sure that you are activating EMS or whatever heat policy you have. And um, you should definitely have a heat policy because prevention is key. And I'm gonna talk about that on the next slide. So for a heat policy, a heat policy is really intended to serve as like a guide for regulating your match play, your practice sessions, hydration breaks, and even um, safety during extreme environmental conditions. So the heat policy should be shared with everyone. You should make sure everyone is aware of the safety precautions. And some of these things below or that, that I talk about now should be considered. So you need to consider um, being um, uh, cognizant with the changing environmental conditions. The biggest thing that we promote in the heat guidelines for recognized to recover is the use of something called the wet bulb globe temperature, okay? It is a type of heat indices. We're all familiar with heat index, but what heat index does not account for is um, the radiant load that comes from the sun as well as the wind speed. And uh, what goes into wet bulb globe temperature uh, heat index is the ambient temperature, the humidity, uh, the, the solar radiation, and the wind speed. So all of those things factor into what is the real heat stress that our athletes are experiencing. Um, you're gonna want to make sure you follow heat acclimatization guidelines and make modifications, especially during preseason practices and conditioning. Another thing is you should make sure that you plan ahead. In that top circle there, you'll see an image. Um, that is a forecasting tool that is a freely open and available for people to use that is um, uh, developed by the National Weather Service. Um, I would have some links that I can share as well after the presentation, or if you have this presentation, those are links within the presentation there. But uh, for example, that is, um, I think the wet bulb globe temperature for tomorrow at 3 p.m. So if you look there, uh, you see red and black and orange. You know, so if you're in Southern Texas or Southern uh, California there, you're gonna want to, or, or Florida for that matter, you're not going to wanna practice at three o'clock tomorrow and or you're gonna have a one hour maximum practice if you're in those red flag conditions. And if you're in black flag, you need to look to moving to a different part of the day. But what that tool does is up to seven, five days out you can know what the wet bulb globe temperature is going to be and move a practice time or plan ahead to make sure that uh, you don't have to modify your practice session um, as much as you didn't intend um, you know, when you're on the field and or if there's a game that you know is going to occur, talking with the referees, talking with um, you know, uh, uh, field officials and letting them know that, hey, we might go into a black flag condition or a red flag condition today. How are we going to handle this? What are we going to do to make sure that these athletes get enough breaks and hydration? Like I said before, hydration helps, but is not a guarantee. Um, it's always recommended that athletes are uh, well hydrated prior to and uh, following the activity during soccer. It's often difficult to get enough fluids in. I think someone else will be speaking about that in a little bit, so I won't step on any toes. But um, another thing is make sure that if you are able, especially at large tournaments, consider hiring and having on-site medical personnel in the form of an athletic trainer, physician, or, or uh, other appropriate medical personnel for your state. And then making sure you have proper equipment ice, tub, uh, uh, towels, water, and shade are all critical to making sure. That there on the right, that red square the or rectangle that you see, that is a wet bulb globe temperature thermometer device. Um, and um, those do have a cost with them. 
uh, but that will be able to allow you to get that temperature on site and make it a little easier for you when you need to make decisions. Next. So this is directly from the heat guidelines um, with recognized to recover. Um, if you don't have a wet bulb globe temperature thermometer, you can still figure out the WBGT temperature. So that, I know it's very small there, but it's bigger on the, uh, the PDF document. If you look on the top there, it says temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. And on the side, it says relative humidity. And what you do is you can look at any you know, on-site temperature device if you have it, or if you have a, a weather app or something, what you can do is look and see what the temperature is, what the humidity is. You can figure out the wet bulb globe temperature. And then what you do is you look and see what category you are in. So step two on the bottom is if you're in that darker category, that's category three, uh, gray there is category two, and the, the whiter category there is category one. Um, these are region-specific guidelines for wet bulb globe temperature. And on the right there, you once you've found which region you're in and what your wet bulb globe temperature is, you can know what you need to do for your sessions that day. So let's say tomorrow you're in Florida and it is 90.5 degrees, uh, which you just saw in the red there. That's going to put your athletes at 3 p.m. at a high risk for heat-related illness. What do I need to do to change my practice? Well, I can't have more than an hour of training and I need at least four four-minute breaks within the hour. They can be one 16-minute break if you should choose, but you also can't have any additional conditioning going on in that practice. Um, you can see orange and yellow and green there as well. And black, you really need to consider either delaying or canceling, um, but those are really hard calls to make. So that's why I recommend the, the wet bulb uh, forecasting tool. Next. So if World Cup can do it, why can't you? So the World Cup match was so hot when they went to um, Brazil uh, that it was the first time that in the US-Portugal match um, that they allowed a water break to occur. So, um, you know, if, if for folks to say, we can't talk to the officials beforehand and talk about a water break, we can't talk about an additional five to 10 minutes of ensuring that we have that in the first and the second halves. Um, to, to be honest, I think that's absolutely ridiculous. You should be able to make sure that you uh, afford your athletes the water breaks, uh, especially during a game or a match, uh, to be able to make sure that they don't overheat. So what are the top five things your club should do? Um, develop a comprehensive heat policy. Um, be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of heat illness. Measure the environmental conditions using WBGT and modify your sessions to reduce the risk of heat illness. This isn't rocket science. Um, be smart. If it's hot, um, make sure your players are getting adequate breaks. Um, work on other drills or other skill sets that don't involve high intensity training. Reduce the overall training time so that the overall heat load on your athletes uh, doesn't become too much. Um, acclimatize your players. I didn't really go into this, but acclimatization is a fancy way of saying of, of describing how your body naturally adapts to exercise in the heat and traditionally takes 10 to 14 days. Um, days one through five are usually um, like one formal practice per day with a maximum of three hours of training time that includes warm up stretches and cool down. And days six through 14, um, you can have double practice days beginning on day six, but you can't exceed five hours total between the two practices. Um, you need to have a minimum of a three hour rest between each training session. And the three hour rest period should be in a cool environment should you have a double session. Um, each double practice day should be followed by a single practice day, again, not to exceed three hours. And athletes should receive at least one day's rest following six days of continuous practice. So those are the key things for heat acclimatization. Um, and I would always uh, cater to the least fit player that you have on your team. If you do that, you will be very smart in ensuring that all players are, are safe on your, on, your, on your field. The last is recognize heat illness immediately. Remove the athlete from, this, from the heat and really start cooling on site if possible. 
um, heat stroke, the longer the amount of time that you are above 104, 105 degrees, the, the, the greater the, the cell death that occurs and the, the, the less likely that your athlete is to survive. We say that, that there's a golden half hour. You have 30 minutes from the time that that person goes into a high level, so 104, 105 or above, um, to get their body temperature cooled rapidly. The best way is via ice water immersion in a cold tub. Um, if you don't have that on site, you need to start cooling with whatever materials you have, but I would plan. Um, if I told you that the, the cancer, the, you know, a cancer causing, you know, a cancer cure out there was, um, you know, literally no cost and, and hundred percent effective. Um, would you use it? I hope so because ice and water doesn't cost anything. You literally need a vessel to put it in and you need to make sure that that person is dunked, uh, in that tub while you're waiting for EMS to arrive, especially if you're in rural locations far from EMS transport. So, um, always activate your EAP just like you would with cardiac. Um, and uh, just so you know, heat stroke is the leading cause of death in the month of August. So um, the rest of the year, cardiac has that, uh, that, that, uh, that badge. So thank you so much. And uh, um, I appreciate your time and attention. There's some key resources um, that, uh, 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 and you can find me as well at the Corey Stringer Institute. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much, Dr. Huggins. Uh, and your last point, uh, August is uh, the key month where we see these. Uh, it's it's because of the things that you talked about, meaning um, non-acclimated young individuals who then all of a sudden go 150 miles an hour and haven't had a progression in the temperatures uh, in, in the summer. Um, some of the statistics are somewhere between 15 and 20 athletes die each year uh, from heat stroke. So some really incredible information. There are a couple questions that I do want to bring up. One of them is, uh, should practice be shortened for younger athletes, question mark, and still an hour when in black and or red? Um, so if you could answer that one. Yes. So um, the, the, the WBGT levels that you see there, um, if it's, if it's red, it's an hour, um, an hour maximum of training, regardless of what level you're at. The thing about kids that I will say is kids are really good at telling you they're hot and stopping. <laughs> it is usually the older ages. Once we get into high school age players that they can push themselves beyond, um, and, or a coach, uh, can, can push a player to their limits, which is a fine line, right? You, you want to see what an athlete is made of, and you want to try and improve their performance on the field and deal with adversity, adversity and tough situations, but you don't want to do it at the expense of their safety. So, um, always make sure that you're following the wet bulb globe temperature guidelines, regardless of what age, um, and black flag it's, it's, you know, if you if you enter black flag, or you're starting practice at Black Black Flag. If you've entered Black Flag and you're there for 10 to 15 minutes, you should really be considering uh, stopping that practice. Uh, you know, um, you know, depending on where you are in the practice, right? But if you're starting practice and it's in the Black Flag and you do not, there's no anticipation of or indication that weather is supposed to uh, start to get cooler. Um, you should also consider postponing that practice or game. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Higgins. Uh, Huggins, one, one, one question that I think we've already answered is what is the actual WBGT website address for that forecast that you had the map? What I would uh, direct everyone to is go to Recognize to Recover because our website is really practical. Uh, it walks through the categories where you are in the country and there are resources there, including links that you can utilize. Uh, and then you can also purchase a WVGT device if you need to. Um, the next question, and I like this question is, um, you know, um, how do you recommend the use of ice vests before, during, or after practice? And I think understanding when we talk about performance and when we're talking about these circumstances, if you can maybe answer that one and then we'll move on to the next topic. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, ice vests. So ice vests are uh, have been commonly used in uh, prior to any sort of activity that you anticipate in the heat uh, for a performance benefit. Um, what it does is oftentimes folks will warm up. They'll do their typical warm up that they normally do 
20 minute, 15, 20 minute warm up in the heat. And what that does is it rises the body temperature more so in really hot and humid conditions, so much so that you're starting the game at 102 and 103 before you even, you know, start the match. So the goal of a cooling vest is to keep the core body temperature low. But I would challenge folks to rather than keeping, rather than even using a cooling vest, so certainly you can, if you have the ability and the funds to be able to do that, it will benefit um, and reduce core body temperature prior to um, the start of a match or a, or a practice. But re consider reducing your, just reducing your warm up session. Um, making sure that you're, you're maybe take half the time, ensure the rest of the time is for either active cooling or drinking fluids, um, and just try to mitigate that rise in that person's body temperature, because you don't want them to hit the ceiling halfway through the second half. You want them to be able to finish that game without um, having a heat-related issue. Um, so those are things to consider. During activity, they have been used at the half or during breaks which again, I think is, is okay to use those things, but please keep in mind that, that um, the more surface area that you cover and the uh, more of the body that you cool and the colder it is, the more you're going to reduce someone's body temperature in a significant way. You don't wanna be careful to not put a cooling vest on someone at the halftime and it doesn't significantly bring their body temperature down but it makes them feel as if they're cooler when in actuality, their core temp is still quite high. So be careful during activity. And I would never ever recommend it. It is not a recommended treatment for anyone with heat illness or heat stroke post activity. Um, the gold standard is cold water tub or a kiddie pool or a, um, you know, a, a, a container, if you will, an inflatable pool that has ice and water in it to be able to actually rapidly reduce someone's body temperature. Thanks so much, Dr. Huggins. Just want to highlight as a coach, as an organization, as you've called 911 for some uh, a, a youth player that is altered, irritable, that is likely heat related, your job is to rapidly start cooling them, pulling them out, getting them in shade, cooling them down in the measures that was just described. Uh, it's not standing waiting for EMS to come. That's It's just like a cardiac arrest, meaning that you are the bridge to their good outcome. So rapidly cool them, get them ice on them, ice towels, uh, cool them down as EMS is coming and let EMS know that you're concerned about a heat related illness. Dr. Huggins, thanks so much. Thanks, George. We're gonna now switch gears um, and we're gonna talk about nutrition. If you haven't noticed, we are gonna be going into extra time uh, in our football match tonight. So uh, we will be going into a couple of extra half, uh, extra time. Uh, so plan on going till about uh, 45 more minutes. So uh, it, great, great information. Uh, with that, we're going to introduce Lindsay Langford, uh, who's one of our sports nutritionists with United States Soccer. She works really closely with our women's national team, as well as our uh, youth women's national teams. Uh, Lindsay Langford, thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I will do my best to catch up a couple minutes for you guys. Um, we can go ahead and get started. So I think the first thing is that I just wanted to clear the air for, for some that may be on the call. I think a lot of times you think of a sports dietitian or even just a dietitian in general, and you think, okay, we will utilize that person when we have someone that, that has a weight management issue. We are looking to put weight on them or take weight off. That's the role of the dietitian. Um, I wanted to lift the veil a little bit and just say sports dietitians do a whole lot more than that. In fact, when I put this scope or speech bubbles, if you will, on the screen, I realized in just a few minutes ago, I didn't even put weight management even on there. So it is a part of my scope for sure, but there's way more that I typically am working with athletes on that's in correlation to um, performance and, and a lot of the, the aspects you can see on this screen. We can go to the next one. 
Um, the, there are three, I apologize, only two were highlighted there where there are actually three topics we're going to talk about today on the next three to four slides. And that's nutrient timing, um, how, when we eat and how we eat, um, is affected and maybe most absorbed and providing the most energy for a, an athlete. Um, also some hydration information. And then the third one that is not highlighted is performance plates, um, that we'll dive into. So topic number one, um, to me, nutrient timing is absolute king. It really is the foundation in working with an athlete. And so whether that's a uh, middle school or on up to the women's national team, uh, the first question that I'm asking them is to kind of tell me what and when you eat in a typical day. Um, so I can see if there are any gaps that take place. And so I will say oftentimes we have athletes that are skipping breakfast or they might have a cliff bar or a granola bar for breakfast and walking out the door. Um, and then throughout their school day, if they are more that the school age athlete, there might be, I mean, typically there would be lunch, but what if they don't like school lunch? Um, so then lunch could be hit or miss. And then right after lunch, we've got practice. And so how well fueled is that athlete that may need two to 2000 um, to 2,500 calories in a day. But yet at this point leading up to practice, they've only consumed 400. I see that quite frequently. And so it's teaching athletes not to backload all of those calories. Then they come home from practice and they're famished. And if you're a parent, you're, they're raiding your kitchen before you can even get dinner on their plate. So that we wanna to try to avoid and really teaching our athletes how to fuel um, throughout their day. And so this is just a quick snapshot of what I felt was a very typical youth athlete. We've got to get some breakfast in them. Um, typically, I would encourage a, a snack within the school day setting. Um, sometimes that's discouraged. So sometimes I do have to work around that. Um, they would have lunch, something before practice. Post-practice, they would have recovery as mom or dad are, are on their way to pick them up. And then they get home and then they have their recovery dinner at that point. And there are quite a few athletes that will for sure have something after dinner. But that is a very typical and encouraged timeline. One rule of thumb that I use is no more than four hours without eating. And so that's something as a coach, maybe you start asking your players a little bit like, hey, have, what did you have before you came here? Or was the last time they consumed calories was at lunch of five hours ago. And, and, you know, as a coach, just their output is going to decrease their risk for injury can increase. Um, many different factors can occur when we have a malnourished athlete. Next, please. When we talk about nutrient timing, one aspect um, that I really try to hone in on is, is just the bookends of your training out of throughout your whole day. The most important to me is what I term the bookends, that you're going into that training session or that game well-fueled, blood sugar levels are elevated enough to, or to be stabilized um, throughout that training session. During training, typically it's just a hydration factor. Um, sometimes I, I will definitely say I, in a game setting, I really encourage you that you're capitalizing on halftime. That's giving them um, time to just replenish glycogen stores. We, we know that the, the sport of soccer is carbohydrate dependent, and um, we really can see an advantage if we're dumping in um, around 15 to 20 grams of carbohydrates at that halftime. Your larger athletes can maybe take in more on the upper end of 30 at that time. Um, but most of the time in a training session, we're not really getting anything in during other than maybe a sports drink. And then afterwards, um, post-training is this concept of recovery nutrition. Um, this is just essentially when um, blood sugar can frequently be dropped. And from a hormonal level, we can get the, the glucose or the carbohydrates to our muscles and aid in that recovery process much faster than if that athlete waits, they're stretching. If, if you guys are implementing stretching post-practice, which is likely encouraged, um, 
they're chatting with their friends. They may be showering. Um, they're waiting on a ride. By the time they get home and have dinner, they've really missed an opportunity for just a protein synthesis and muscle building and, and repairing to take place. So big fan of post-training, um, post-training and recovery nutrition. And from that prior slide, you can, it, it's typically something like a protein shake or even a bar. Um, it can be whole foods for sure. Something like a Greek yogurt cup, we get 15 grams of protein in. Ideally, we're looking to get about 10 to 20, but that is definitely dependent on a lot of different factors, but um, that's a, a, that's a good range about that maybe even higher, like 15 to 20. So um, take care and protect the bookends of your training session with nutrition. Next, please. The, the second topic that I work with athletes on is um, performance plates. And these are some that I've kind of designed myself, but it was absolutely mimicked off of the um, United States Olympic Committee. And you can do a quick Google search and find those. Um, but essentially, it is teaching athletes that really nutrition shouldn't ideally be the same every single day, but that we have days where it's going to be a little bit lighter, or we know it's going to be a two a day training session. We've got to have enough carbohydrates and enough, um, yeah, essentially carbohydrates on board to prepare for that training session. And so you just can visually see, and I apologize that the, the font is very small, but on a light day, and that's classified as typically one hour or less, or maybe even a recovery day, you can see about half of that plate is the green and that's fruits and vegetables, a quarter of it protein and a quarter of it carbohydrate. As we progress down the lineup and increase our volume, Moderate day, you can see it's almost a third, a third, a third, and then a hard day or a game day, we're definitely looking at about half of that plate carbohydrates, a quarter fruits and vegetables and a quarter of it proteins. And so I just think this is a very simplistic visual for athletes to see um, how to build their plate on a given day. When I'm working with youth, I will make one disclaimer. I might not focus so much on exactly changing your plate in accordance to your training. One of my main focuses might just be that we're including all three of those wider food groups, a carbohydrate source, a protein, and quote, color. Fruits and vegetables is what provides those colors, those antioxidants, um, a lot of different phytonutrients and vitamins and minerals. And so that's, a, that's again, bringing the performance plates down even one more notch um, for your youth athletes. Um, Next slide, please. The third and final thing that I wanted to just speak on today is hydration. And I think we can get very detailed oriented when it comes to hydration, exactly how many ounces we need, how many milligrams of sodium and electrolytes. But um, so I'm, I might share a little bit of that, but let me first, I guess, just educate um, that we all know this is important. And, and we learned a good bit from Dr. Huggins presentation right before this as well. But our muscles are made up of 75% water. So if we want them to perform, to contract, to produce that power output, they have got to be well hydrated. Um, also in, in injury prevention sake as well, if we can keep those muscles hydrated and those, those fiber strands um, well moistened, that can also potentially help with increase or decreasing injury risk. Um, from a GI perspective in just making sure our nutrients are being absorbed and they are being, um, broken down and preventing constipation that frequently can occur in athletes. Um, hydration plays a big role in that. One other aspect is just from our hunger standpoint. And if I am working with an athlete on weight management, hydration has to be one of our number one topics um, to, to address that frequently that gut to brain axis, the, that thirst and the hunger pathways can frequently be um, just confused. And so sometimes is an athlete really hungry or are they just dehydrated? Another factor to consider. 
Also from an energy perspective, being able to break down the food that we're consuming and really um, absorb the nutrients and, and break down the water soluble vitamins. Um, and lastly, just from, again, from the recovery aspect, we know that you're going to go out, you're going to sweat, and now it's time to, to replenish some of those fluids lost. So those are the reasons why here, are just like four tips to maybe take with you or, or hydration adoptions, I guess. Um, so how much should you be taking in? You frequently will hear eight glasses a day. Um, that is not wrong. That's a very standard, um, recommendation, I think by American Academy of Dietetics, but it is, um, it is something that for athletes, I typically customize a little bit more based just on their body weight. As we just saw, muscle is made up of 75% water and typically our athletes are carrying more muscle mass. So I, I recommend half of your body weight in fluid ounces per day, half of your body weight in fluid ounces per day. So we've got 150 pound athlete, that's 75 ounces. So that's step one. Step two is that we've got to carry a water bottle with you um, and that you know how many ounces it is. So for that athlete, this is a standard, whoops, sorry, you can't really see that too well, but a lot of standard water bottles are 24 to 32 and, and really just recognizing, okay, I should be filling this bottle up three times within my day. Then it's maybe even taking it a step further and saying, okay, I want one and a half of these done by lunch. And I want the next one and a half done by the time I eat dinner. Usually after dinner, I try to minimize fluids just so we're not waking up in the middle of the night and, and disrupting sleep. And then lastly, it doesn't just have to be water. Um, I, I am definitely a fan of a lot of different hydration products or powders, electrolyte powders that you might add in, um, different sports drinks, um, the carbonated waters or seltzers, or even just fruit infused water. So those are all things that can maybe get an athlete to drink a little bit more when you might hear them say that they don't like water. So, um, I believe I might have an exit slide, but that was my final, um, that was my final slide there. Thank you guys for paying attention and hanging in there. Lindsay, really, really great stuff. Um, I wanted to ask one quick question and I just think about what we do in our national teams and, and the slide that you had the low, the moderate and the hard trainings. Um, I think a lot of our youth players, maybe sometimes are in the dark with regards to the schedule for their week. Um, and I know you touched upon and youth players kind of staying with the colors with our national teams, we probably give them a little bit of information at, at meals. So they know how to prepare. Do you think that it's valuable for our coaches to at least maybe share kind of a weekly schedule and so that players can anticipate what their fuel requirements might be throughout the week. Because I think that could be a really good tip that our coaches and our, and our clubs take away. Yes. Um, good, good question. I, I absolutely think that that would be fantastic to help promote nutrition. And, and I don't know if, if coaches maybe want to keep that schedule close to the vest. I'm not, I, I don't know the culture of that super well, but if that was possible and something a coach felt um, comfortable doing, I absolutely think it could help your athletes in fueling and that you're using that as an education tool for them. So yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think that's a great point. Um, thanks so much, Lindsay. We'll obviously share this with everyone. Also know there are uh, some resources on nutrition and hydration on Recognize to Recover. So please, by all means, utilize those. Uh, Lindsay, thanks again. Yeah, you're welcome. We're going to go ahead and now shift uh, and we're going to talk about load recovery and match congestion and the growing demand on our soccer players. We've kind of talked about this. Uh, I know everyone is uh, familiar with that across the landscape. We are without question fortunate to have Dr. Rick Cost, um, our high performance director at U.S. Soccer, someone I work very closely with uh, every day. We share an office together. Uh, Rick, uh, it is an honor to have you, uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, George, and thanks everyone for 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 
participating in this amazing summit and i i heard some like a lot of good stuff that mown a lot of grass in front of my feet already which is a good thing to be honest so i i, I want to echo all everything has been said is amazing and um this, this is one of those topics where 10 years ago we probably looked at this whole thing about match conjection in a totally different perspective of adaptation and we need to do more you know you could like ericsson said we need to do like ten thousand hours of training before you master something and then someone else said no if you do ten thousand i'm going to do eleven thousand and then someone says twelve thousand and more was better and all of a sudden we are now in an age in an era where I, I we we try to tend to think that more still is better but because all these games are are so close to each other like we we play games in the highest level within four days but 10 years ago we said you know we need 72 hours to recover from a game so how can we plan a new game pretty much within that window and um the whole issue is that we now in a situation that we try try to mimic a situation where we tend to push on a passive or active way ourselves into normal homeostasis or normal cell standardization. We can't, the bodies just don't have the time anymore to congest the games. So now we're thinking by like hydration strategies, um, icing after pre-games, um, like different types of uh, nutrition, but even um, altitude training, everything. We try to grab everything to become better in digesting those games. While on the highest level, we don't have a, we don't have a choice. But on the lower levels, we actually do have a choice. And that's pretty much what I'm going to talk about in the next like seven or eight minutes. If you can go to the next slide. To give you an example, this is the World Cup. So typically every World Cup would have like four or five days in between games. That means, let's say a game recovery would be like 72 hours. So that means we play as USA, we play the first game on the 21st of November in the World Cup and the second game on the 25th. So if we need to have three days of recovery, how are we going to actually be ready for the next game? it's pretty much not possible to be ready for the next game. So in previous, like previous times, you would say we need to adapt. So in a training load perspective, from a timing perspective, we need to train ourselves to be ready to be able to play two games in four days. But are we able to train two times 90 minutes in four days and have training sessions in between? So typically you need a day off to recover because every time you step on the field, you need another day to recover. So it's pretty much impossible. So we also know that by the end, the final is being played and all these games are so not near to each other that the level of gameplay will probably be a bit lower than on the beginning. And you also see that if you, you see like tournaments and you look at those load, uh, you monitor the load per game, you see that there's a significant drop in level. And then all of a sudden, by the end of this, uh, by, when the opponents get better and the power drops we still find the power to actually push ourselves and maybe deliver our utmost and a most load in in the final but then there's this other problem because the final the last games in competition typically are played now on the uh, if i'm if i'm correct on the 12th of november if you look at the european teams so the US team has 12 players at this in this moment playing in Europe. So the 12th of November. So the first game with the club again is like on the 31st of December. So when you're ready and you've played this whole tournament, you're you 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 pushed everything, your whole energy in there, and then you go back to your team. So when is the time that you're going to offload? If we can go to the next slide, the, the idea of training pretty much is to have adaptation. This is like an ancient way of looking at uh, adaptation. It, it, we call it supercompensation. So every time when you play the next game and you're in your undercompensation, which is the part of the graph below the black line, we actually, like we are not recovered and we decline in level. So the next game will be significantly lower in level. So if that happens every time again and again, you pretty much go towards overtraining. So, if I look at the not top sport environment, but more like the amateur environment, we still tend to push 
all these tournaments and all these trainings in such a small short time that we keep on pushing kids and even older people into subcompensation into lower compensation instead of looking at what do we actually need to have super compensation and we have the possibility on those lower levels to actually find ways to give kids but also like players in general to give them time off or do other work, other sports like play tennis or maybe play basketball or do something completely different that has a, a totally different perspective on your or load load it costs you a different amount of load or a different type of load so that you'll be able to recover from that soccer game so that the next training session you actually are better instead of less so with the national teams the thing we we did was there was this general idea that every time a player comes into our camp we need to load them more heavy because we think that the international game asks more or demands more of every player. And, and when when we came in, and, and I think uh, Dr. George and myself did a super good job in also um, like teaching and educating uh, coaches was we're not here to load players. We're here to teach players to learn to play the game. So we went from loading days to learning days. So now coming into our camp, it's about how can we increase the pace of the game because that's a different um, that's that's definitely different in national international game versus other competitions. The pace of the game is higher, but it's the clubs who are loading the, the players. So coming into our camp, it's about learning the game, being more efficient on the field, having a learning experience, and that's how we now try to get kids into. A better situation not by doing more but being smarter and learning more and that delivers us like a, i think otherwise i wouldn't advocate for it a good training plan where we work for kids and every individual is playing the same amount of minutes and it sounds super strange because obviously there is a kid in the under 17 who is better than another kid so should we give that on the 17 kid every single game, every single minute? No, we say no. The learning experience is for everyone until you're highly specialized. So then we talk about like under 18, under 19, maybe under 20 even, every kid deserves the same amount of minutes. And why? Because the kids who we think are the best are playing the more, most minutes. They also are the ones who being overloaded and not being able to reach it ideal super compensation and a good training plan and the kids who are underloaded or don't play the minutes those are the kids who typically drop in level because they are just underloaded they are not able to have a good training plan because they tend to drop in level if you can go to the next next slide so what what we now try to do on the higher levels which is somehow some somewhere it's super good but on the other hand it also says something about where we're at at this moment is homeostasis is pretty much what we're looking for we're looking for cell balance so that the whole system is in balance that's when you typically like fully recover but because we the, like time is our enemy we're not able to have a normal recovery so we tend to put players in hyperbaric rooms you know where the oxygen level is super high and why we want to bring them back we want to shorten this that time of recovery or we uh, put them in like floating beds or we we do uh, ultraviolet light or we have like sleeping guides you know because because of all the stress all these players tend to sleep pretty bad and then we have, have all these iphones with blue light that that just have a negative um a, ne a negative effect on sleep and sleeping time it seems like sleep is less and less important while nowadays sleep is more important than ever because we are so awake during the day. Even if you go to school, you're so awake during the day that by the end of the day, your brain is pretty much down. You know, you're off. But we still keep on poaching. Oh, we need to look at those screens just five minutes before we go to sleep. And then we find it strange that we only sleep like seven or eight hours or not even able to, to make six cycles of one and a half hours. So all these modalities sound super nice and they sound super super fashionable but they're actually for us a way to bring back the old days where we want to have players that are able to reach that homeostasis that normal recovery on their own
but they're just not capable of it. So the lesson or the takeaway here is if you have the possibility, and if we can go to the next slide, if you have the possibility to, to take control of that whole orchestra around those teams and you'll be able to play like the violin we need to play the violin because if there's one item missing if one of these people are playing hard rock music the whole everything collapses you want to have a stable environment you want to have time to recover you want to have the intensity in the game to improve the speed of the game you want to have a coach who is aware that every player is in need of the same minutes every kid deserves a learning experience but if one of those items falls out you're pretty much you know scrambling everything all together and it's not an orchestra anymore and 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 that's pretty much what what we're trying to to achieve is really taking that that individual player as the starting point and figuring out what is the best way to educate and teach those individuals moving forward in order to increase the level of international play in soccer and moving forward as one of the best nations in soccer in like uh, 2030. Because we, for the men's side and on the women's side, we have high goals and high expectations. But with not recovered players, and if the matches are not, uh, if players are not able to digest those games, we only drop in level and we definitely will not raise in level. And that's pretty much what I have to tell right now, uh, George. Rick, I, I thought um, that was great. And I think a, a one point that I, I walked away from, and if I was a coach or a club, and I know it's hard, I know it's hard, but when you talk about the most minutes in those players are overloaded and are compensated, and then they never recover to then be able to build from week to week to week. And then the underloaded player drops in their level of play. They have poor training. They, they end up not performing and so coaches think that they're not developing but the coach has a responsibility in that and I think one of the things that coaches can do is when they have a, a match plan and they know that these four to seven players are not going to get 45 minutes in a match or 55 minutes in a match is have a structured 20 minutes after the match where they can really build that load because otherwise that kid is going to lose two three days of training and over time that is really horrible for their development. So I'm curious what your thought is on that. And then I have one question from the uh, audience. Yes, 100%. I think like overloading and underloading are equally bad. It's not like you want to you want a kid to do less because that's better for them. It's also not like, hey, if you, you didn't play a game last week, seven days ago, you're better in playing the game this week. Not at all. It's better to have structuralized uh, like a system that gives you resilience, that brings you resilience, because resilience is like what you're looking for in training. So the overload part is when the balance in your team shifts to one or two players, they do everything and they tend to get overloaded. But the underloaded part, definitely super important that those kids, you know, they need to have extra training after the game um, or maybe on, on match day plus one. If you have like a day left and you want to do something extra with those kids, you know, that's the moment to to bring those kids into a situation they can do some something extra. But I think, honestly, if we can divide all minutes over every individual player, I think that's the best approach because again, you know, on a match day plus one, why not just play tennis as recovery? You know, why not do something different? Bring them out of those soccer environments. It's actually a fact that if you teach kids multiple sports, their whole like adaptation mechanism, their whole coordination system will be a lot better when they're like 12, 13 years old. And they will be better soccer players, although they might have played less soccer, but their whole, like their whole, the, their body, their their cognitive, co cognitive system, everything is being pushed. If you do different stuff also, don't specialize too early and definitely, you know, don't choose one or two players that are the best to give them everything, but divide because over time, that one kid who is small in the under sevens, he might be the guy playing in MLS. And I the love, other I one, love that. I love that. And resilience is what was a word that you shared that I think as coaches, we have to think about how do we make our players resilient and, and really bring all those skill sets that in the end, as a coach, 
Your goal isn't about that moment at 12, 13, 14 winning. It's about at 18, 19, 20, 21. Did you, did you really build the foundation for that athlete? Um, Rick Koss, thanks so much. I uh, really appreciate the insight. And I, I know the Federation is really excited uh, to, to continue to work with you in the game across the United States. Thanks so much. Awesome, guys. Everyone hang on with us. We have just a, a few more talks. Uh, this is our last formal talk. And then we have a couple of unique things that we want to share. Um, Dr. Holly Benjamin is a very, very close friend. A colleague is one of the, if not the leading pediatric sports medicine physicians in the United States, uh, is on every consensus document policy in youth sports. Uh, Dr. Benjamin, we are fortunate to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Thanks, George, so much for having me. You are uh, always inspirational, and I've learned things tonight myself, this amazing panel that you've put together, and and I'm truly honored to be part of it and to share some pearls. I will tell you, I knew I was towards the end. Mine is, is also fairly simple, um, very practical, and I'll get through it pretty quickly for you all. Um, you can advance the slide. I have no disclosures, you can go on. All right. So. Today, we're going to discuss just four quick things. We're gonna discuss the risk factors for overuse injuries. We're going to define burnout because I think it's important not just to talk about overtraining, but also burnout. Uh, we'll discuss high-risk overuse musculoskeletal injuries um, in soccer. And I wanna talk a little bit about overuse injury prevention because I think it applies at all levels, but particularly with my interest in, in youth sports and, and uh, uh, athlete development, I think it's important to uh, to, to address that. Uh, next slide. I apologize. There, I should have taken out the animation. I didn't realize it was on there. Um, I'm going to talk while that comes into play. So I think we've covered some of this, but the numbers keep growing. There are over 30 million children participating in organized sports, uh, 7 million high school uh, athletes, uh, they're over, but I want to get to the injuries. So high school athletics accounts for about 2 million injuries annually. That's 500,000 doctor visits. That's up to 30,000 hospitalizations a year. So that, that there's some significant injuries that happen as a result of sports. Um, over 3.5 million children under the age of 14 are treated annually for sport-related injuries. And many of those may or may not be related to being a specialized athlete. Um, furthermore, overuse injuries account for half of all sports injuries in middle school and high school. Um, we, we do the best that we can in the pediatric sports world to track injuries. Dr. Gianti's done a ton for us in understanding a lot about this, um, but tracking injuries is difficult. Perhaps injuries are underreported. We really don't know. Um, next slide. I wanted to specifically put a slide in about burnout, and I think for here, one take home point is just that it's burnout to me is when there's a loss of enjoyment in sport participation. Um, overtraining might be poor performance, that might be fatigue, uh, that might be the more the overtraining. Um, but burnout is when you're no longer enjoying what you do. And that is a, it, it is probably you're a little late to the game if you pick up on that as a coach or a parent or anything else. But that loss of enjoyment, that that no longer desiring to play. And the, these athletes are often still playing at a very high level and still performing well, but the the enjoyment of the sport is gone. And that and that's a big red flag that we need to take a step back and address the mental health, the physical well-being of the athlete. So please pay attention to that. Um, I also wanted to mention that over my years in sports medicine, uh, it's been uh, there's definitely been an increase in uh, kids themselves coming in and saying that their goal is to make money during their sport, that, you know, that that's, that's an, a very important goal for them is to 
be a professional athlete. And these are 10, 11, 12 year olds sometimes and things like that. And they, you know, there's just a little reality check there that this is a, this is a marathon when you're going to be, we want a lifelong athlete. That's what we want. We want physically active adults. We want people to enjoy all sports and be physically active. Um, that's one of the big arguments against specialization is just exposure at a young age so that you can play soccer, but maybe as an adult, you'll transition to something different. Um, the reality check is, is some statistics. 2.2% of high school girls and 2% of boys will get college scholarships. Maybe 6% of high school athletes or, or even um, high school age club athletes will ever play sports in college. Over 70% of high school athletes quit all organized sports by age 15. And only 0.2 to 0.5% of high school athletes will ever make it to a professional level in any sport. So um, I have conversations with uh, patients and uh, about, you know, enjoying the sport, being as good as you can be, but, you know, to have other goals besides being a professional athlete, because that's that's really hard and that can be a letdown. And that leads to a lot of negativity and mental health issues with that. That's a that's a really aspirational goal that maybe isn't realistic. Um, uh, next slide. All right. So I think there's a little delay here. Um, this slide is gonna just highlight that again, to the point that's been made over and over, is that early participation in organized sports and the loss of free play is sort of the beginning of part of the problem regarding sports specialization. There's just too much opportunity to play sport, a single sport year round that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. There's pressure, there's money, there's, there's advertisements. Um, you can click the slide again. Uh, and there's money being part of the problem at younger ages. So uh, what we, not only do we have to worry about sports specialization, but we also have to worry about specialized specialists. And what does that mean? That means you're not just specializing in soccer, but you're being a goalkeeper when you're eight years old or 10 years old and just playing a goalkeeper. So like things like that um, also increase the risk of overtraining, increase the risk of burnout, increase the risk of injury, increase the risk of mental health issues and all of those things. Um, next slide. This next slide is a Venn diagram. And this is my one of my favorite slides uh, because it talks about the factors contributing to overuse injuries. And I explain this on a regular basis in my office when people present injured and they say, well, why did I get injured? Um, and I say that it's, you have to look at genetics, biomechanics and workload. And it could be one of those factors. It could be all three. The best example of this is my favorite example is a cross country runner who's running high school, let's say, you know, 70 miles a week. And are they running too much, 80 miles a week? Is that a workload problem? Well, it might be a workload problem that they're running too much, but their, their teammates are also running that same amount and they're not injured. So then we'll look at, well, is it a biomechanical problem? Is it the way they kick the ball? Is it the way they throw, the way they run? That's a problem, biomechanics. Or is it that they're, the way they're built, they have genetic issues about extreme lack of flexibility or, you know, really bad flat feet or something like that. So uh, as I said, I, I like this compartmentalization and as well as understanding that there's overlap there because it helps me understand why people get hurt. It helps me address their injuries more comprehensively because at the end of the day with overuse injuries, I'm often talking about the, the risk factors and the contributions to injury, the part that's workload, the part that's biomechanics and the part that's genetics. And when we have this comprehensive approach to overuse injuries, we do a better job at treating and also preventing. And I say that as well to my patients and families and athletes and coaches is that the treatment is often the prevention. So it's not the end of the day, it's not the, the worst thing in the world to have a 10 year old have Severs disease, which is like soccer heel or a tendonitis or anything like that, because sometimes that makes them um, be aware that they that there are things out there for injury prevention. It makes them be aware that that they are at risk to get injured. So um, sometimes it, we we spin it to the good, if that makes sense. Next slide. This next slide is 
um, an important concept that I want to address that not just for tendinopathy, but for bone stress injuries, like stress fractures and everything else. And, and when this little diagram comes into play, um, I do want to uh, be able to say that the main thing, if you can see me, is here's, here's onset of inflammation and abusive training and failed adaptation. Here's pain threshold. Pain threshold is much higher than when you start to get injured in an overuse model. So it's kind of subclinical, if you will. So by the time someone is experiencing pain and especially starting to fail to perform in their sport, you know, the horse is out of the barn, the ship has sailed, whatever you want to say is that injury has been brewing for a long time. When someone comes in with an obvious overuse injury and they say they've only had a week or two of pain, probably started being injured, you know, six weeks ago or more, maybe, maybe months. So just keep that in mind. It's an important concept that it's not necessarily even having a high pain threshold. It's just the way the body works. So once you hit that, um, and also once you cross into recovery then, and you decrease loads, you, you uh, increase strength and start to uh, actually achieve recovery, you're still subclinical. You're, you're feeling better, you feel recovered, but your body might not be fully recovered. So a lot of times people are attempting to return to sport and they're just going too fast. It's like couch to 5K. I don't care at what level you're at, you have to take a, a very graduated, very, very um, uh, logical approach uh, to returning to sport, to avoid just being a yo-yo with constant re-injuries. Uh, next slide. I wanted to highlight, and with this next slide, the risk factors for overuse injury. Um, yeah, you can do the next slide. Uh, growth related factors and what we call intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Uh, the biggest thing in kids is, is they have open growth plates, they're filled with cartilage, they're at higher risk for injury sometimes than even tendons and ligaments, but also just the, the things that about your body, that's intrinsic factors. That's your anatomic factors, your flexibility, your, your strength, your flat feet, your loose joints. Um, but then there's also your previous level of injury and conditioning that have affected your body. You have mileage on your body from old injuries. And also um, your body's affected by your nutrition, which we've heard and your, your psychosocial well-being. Extrinsic factors in some ways are somewhat easier to control. That's the, um, the way you're coached or your training progression that has to do with scheduling practices, uh, competitions, um, things like that. And then also footwear, equipment, uh, things like that. And the influence not of yourself on yourself, but from outside. So those are extrinsic factors. Next slide. So in the next slide, we're gonna talk about key points to successfully treating overuse injuries. The I have four points that I think are important that are very practical that everyone can understand. Number one is what are you really dealing with with the overuse injury? Yes, you have hip pain or, or leg pain, but what is really going on? Is it a bone injury? Is it a soft tissue? Um, just let's, let's figure it out. Um, and sports medicine physicians are a really good starting point for that. And then for every injury, uh, again, I kind of talked about genetics, biomechanics and workload, but it's also what I call a victim and a culprit. And I'll, I'll explain that in a minute here. So it's, you know, this global overuse is, is, is in some ways just a catchphrase and a bag, but you have to really break it down as what did cause the overuse? What part of it was that? Um, I think we all know this, but rest in, on anti-inflammatory medications really have never healed an injury, especially an overuse injury. Um, it's very uh, disturbing to athletes when they've been told by someone to rest for four to six weeks and just complete rest. And some of them are compliant with that and they do that. And then when they go back, they feel their pain comes right back. They feel injured, nothing accomplished. And sometimes they're even worse as a result of the rest. They get weaker, lose flexibility and, and you're worse than you ever were. So I am a fan of relative rest. I think it was mentioned by Dr. Peroff for even for concussion. It's also for the musculoskeletal injuries, relative rest, um, 
is, is super important to keep them going in some way, shape or form. And then obviously rehabilitation is the key. So the therapists are my friends, um, athletic trainers are my best friends because they take care of our athletes, my patients, they make me look good because they're the ones in the trenches that really get athletes healthy from a musculoskeletal standpoint. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to talk about victims and culprits. That's kind of a new way of thinking for me, or not thinking, but of terminology for me to explain things, but I think it works well. So what is a victim and what is a culprit? And I'll give you two examples. Uh, soccer player, you can hit the, the next return on the slide, please. Soccer player runner with anterior and lateral knee pain. What, what is the victim? The victim is the knee. That's what feels injured in the body, but what's the culprit? What's causing that knee to be sore? It might be a tight IT band, it might be a weak glute muscle. So the culprits are how you recover. So that's what you're gonna focus on in physical therapy, for example. A soccer player with heel pain and Achilles tendonitis. The victim is the poor Achilles tendon. Um, but what's the culprit? Bad cleats, old shoes, flat feet, a recent growth spurt. So again, it's just a different conceptual way of understanding uh, how we approach overuse injuries. Next slide. I wanted to touch base in terms of when to get imaging or when to refer, because this applies to uh, coaches, to parents, to athletes themselves about when should they speak up, when should they seek advice and from primary care providers as well, because I, I function as a specialist in my world. And the basics of this pain greater than three weeks, um, especially consistent pain, you start thinking again, as I said, by the time you're feeling pain and pain threshold, things could have been brewing for a lot longer. So pay attention to when you see a pattern of constant pain. Obviously, any serious um, red flags like nighttime pain, tingling, numbness, joint swelling, that's um, I'd go sooner rather than later to seek care. Any acute injury or trauma, that's pretty obvious. People who you know, go down on the field with what a sprain versus broken ankle, they're gonna come in right away. But sport performance, that definitely gets people in. Um, the problem is that sport performance um, can be affected for weeks to months before it's truly limited to the point that they actually come in. So sometimes delays have been made by really waiting until you just can't do it anymore uh, and seek care. Sometimes it just means the recovery period is gonna be that much longer and it can be frustrating. As far as imaging goes, obviously in orthopedics, imaging is super important. The x-ray does look at the bony anatomy, but x-ray has limitations. And I think that's my message here is that a normal x-ray doesn't mean nothing's wrong. Um, we're lucky enough to have amazing technology, particularly with MRI, um, that I can tell you in the setting, for example, of, of the picture I've shown here of a stress fracture in the hip, which is a high-risk injury. Um, probably less than 20% of stress fractures will have any x-ray finding, um, and but almost 100% of them will have an abnormal MRI. Now, it's not to say that everybody should roll in the office, get the x-ray and have an MRI. That's not really, there's a many, many things that we look at on the x-ray that are important um, and critical. Uh, a lot of x-rays are done weight-bearing, MRIs are done lying on the table. So very important to us and it is the most appropriate starting point, but you have to balance with um, somewhat being reassured with a normal x-ray with knowing when the proper indication is, is to get advanced imaging such as an MRI. And that usually is a good medical decision making, um, but you have to be, be patient with uh, physicians and healthcare providers as they go through the process of starting with an x-ray, making recommendations and trying to find the right appropriate uh, indications for getting um, an MRI. All right, next slide. I did want to highlight with the next slide four high-risk areas that are overuse injuries in soccer that are very common. Um, number one is the hip. I think the hip in, in any uh, sport that is presenting as an injured joint is serious, um, but the, it's one of the higher risk areas that we see. Um, so 
one of the some of the red flags with hip pain would be groin pain with weight bearing, a positive hop test on one leg, pain with rotation of the hip in and out. Um, the highest risk injuries that we see are nothing really is ever good with those kind of findings, but femoral neck stress fracture, uh, a high risk is very high risk, and then certainly labral tear, sports hernias, so um, musculoskeletal sprains and strains uh, tears are all on the table with, with that kind of presentation of groin pain. Um, number two, tibia pain. So again, we all, you know, soccer players are particularly challenging with their tibias because despite the protection that they use and shin guards and all that, they have sore shins very frequently for a wide variety of reasons. Um, reproducible bony tenderness um, can be shin splints, it can be stress fractures. Um, going beyond those kind of symptoms, I also see quite a bit of soccer players that come in with um, possible exertional compartment syndrome. That's um, uh, a little tricky uh, injury that occurs, but it sometimes presents with tightness, pressure, cramping in the legs. Um, but it's it's uh, it's hard to diagnose. Um, it usually is pressure building up in the soft tissue compartments of the leg. You have to have a high index of suspicion for this, and there are special pressure testing that can be done for that. Um, but it usually takes a while to diagnose it. It's not something that we usually do right off the bat. We're usually screening for stress fractures, sometimes getting blood tests in these type of athletes, making sure their iron is good, uh, that, that we don't find any other uh, metabolic health problems. And then um, if you have pretty severe exertional cramping that doesn't respond to, to physical therapy, nutrition interventions, hydration treatments, uh, supplements, things like that, then sometimes compartment testing can be done. So it's just important to be aware of it. It's still pretty rare, um, but it is, um, it is a real uh, problem that we don't wanna miss in terms of high-risk injuries. Um, and then just to finish up the foot, the foot takes a lot of beating in soccer. When it comes to the inside part of the foot, the medial foot, uh, the biggest concern I have is we do see tendonitis, we do see plantar fasciitis, but vague midfoot pain that maybe affects the arch, but also affects that medial bone that sticks out that sometimes rubs in the cleat. That can be a stress fracture of uh, the navicular bone. Navicular bones, there's just something, there's two of the main ones in the body. They don't have good blood supply. Stress fractures in that bone can be very serious. So um, bony pain, in the medial part of the foot should be seen sooner rather than later in any athlete. And then lastly, I wanted to touch base on the lateral foot pain. So that fifth metatarsal bone pain, sometimes it seems like a foot sprain or an ankle sprain, but that foot pain, um, particularly bony pain, uh, does raise the risk of being what's called, if you've heard of it, a Jones fracture, but that's a, a fracture at a certain part of the the fifth metatarsal bone, and that can be pretty serious as well. Most of these high-risk um, uh, injuries that occur, the treatment is different than sprains and strains. Almost all of these end up on crutches, casting, a significant amount of time off, um, and sometimes they even have to be treated with surgery if they're missed and they're too serious. So some of these high-risk areas should be looked at sooner rather than later. Um, but again, basic sprains and strains are still far more common than these high-risk overuse injuries that we see. Next slide. I've got two more quick ones. The next slide is just to go over pearls for prevention. So the AAP recommends um, safe exercise in children and adolescents should be somewhat individualized, but some general guidelines, which just follows up everything that you've heard here tonight about playing other sports, not specializing, taking time off, things like that, actually build a better athlete. So in general, exercise limits up to five days per week, two to three months off per year, cross training being encouraged, not just permitted, doing, making sure you do strength training, flexibility training, really work the core. The core is the key to every injury prevention out there. Um, limits on uh, aggressive increases in exercises and being very cautious always about the kid that's on multiple sports um, at one time or per season. So uh, some of these just lead, are really, um, lead to significant increases in injury risks as well as mental health stress. Next slide. I think the take home point there is just to encourage, the more we can change the, 
the thought process that encouraging our athletes to have a couple months off from their sport um, of choice is just so healthy for them in so many ways. It's really important. All right, so in summary, prevention of overuse injuries, reverse the patterns of early sport specializing, specialization, which means promote diversification, educate all of us. All of us need as much education as we can about rules and safety guidelines, proper form, et cetera. And you've heard today how important healthy lifestyles are, nutrition, sleep, and recovery. Balanced training is important, flexibility and strength. And then it's always being vigilant, um, not paranoid, but just vigilant to injury, overtraining, and burnout. Your athletes should be happy. It's the greatest joy in the world to have athletes enjoying what they're doing. Um, uh, it's just amazing. And then um, our physicians that are here to help I try, a lot of athletes look like they're scared of me when they come in the office. And I said, I'm here to keep you in the game, not out of your game. It might be temporary, but if you work with me, you'll be better, healthier, you'll be better faster if we do the right thing. So um, that's important. And next slide. And I think that's all I've got for you. Um, Holly, I had to put go, go ahead, go ahead, Holly. Oh, I just said, when this comes in, I'm sitting actually at the Sky game right now. Um, we are in the playoffs, uh, so I'm sitting in the back room. I, I actually said that. I think I go, I think the sky is playing and she's probably going to be there. So, yes, you confirmed it for me. Um, I'll be quick because I hope not. I am in the high. training room. Um, I love the victim in the yep. coaches. I think for our coaches, um, I think understanding, hey, here's the injury. And then what are the things that you can do, right? to prevent it and to, to recover from it. So Holly, thank you so much for a great talk. Um, we will again, make sure that our coaches across the country have access to this. Um, as always, thanks, Holly. Really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks. So we're going to finish with uh, two quick presentations. Uh, this one I think is really, really important um, and a concept that I want everyone to think about, especially when, we, when we've heard of all these things that we can do to mitigate risk and protect our players. Really excited to uh, welcome Sarah Crisman, Dr. Crisman, to talk about a new approach on not only concussion education, but also pregame safety huddles that would address heat emergencies, cardiac arrest, and emergency action plans. Dr. Crisman, Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thanks so much, George. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, as as uh, George said, I'm Dr. Christman. I'm a pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist in Seattle. And uh, this work is actually work that I do with my colleague, uh, Dr. Krocious, who's a, a health a communication specialist and implementation specialist, which um, unfortunately she's not here tonight, but I, I can sort of talk for both of us. But um, this is a, you know, as George said, we uh, initially were doing this about concussion and we're actually thinking about kind of it, expanding it. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about that as we go through. So uh, everything takes a team. This was a CDC funded grant. Um, we were lucky enough to have a, a lot of people working on this with us. And so a lot of these people are athletes, you know, we really feel like um, in order to uh, develop really concussion education that fits in the culture of soccer, you really have to start with that from the ground up. So we started from the very beginning saying like, let's talk to athletes and players and coaches and parents, and let's really think about how we could make something that will fit seamlessly. And so George was a huge part of that. So he was a part of this project from the, from the start. Um, and so that was really exciting, really fun to partner with him. Next slide. So what, what is this about? So, you know, we were working in the concussion field and we were like, and I think, you know, Dr. Karath has sort of talked a little bit about this, but one of the big challenges in concussion is kids don't want to tell people that they're injured. And there is a part of it of like, oh, you know, I just feel a little bit off. Is this really, am I really injured? But there's also a part of it of like, I don't want to look like a wimp or like, I don't want the coach to take me out. Um, and so that adults matter, uh, coaches matter, refs matter, parents matter, all of the adults in that in that context matter. And so we thought, you know, we can do all of this concussion education until we're blue in the face. But at some point we have to say to kids, we wanna know, we wanna know if you're injured. Because the truth is we wanna get that kid out of the game. They're gonna get back faster. They're gonna get better faster if, if we can pull them out and make sure that they don't get a continued injury. Next slide. So what we said is, well, what, what is already happening that we can link on to? And we're like, you know, if you're before the game, taking a few minutes to, to 
pick someone's you know, shin guards and make sure they don't have earrings on. You know, couldn't you also talk a little bit about concussion in just that time? Um, so we thought about this idea of huddles. So pregame safety huddles, um, adults are already involved in that. And so this idea of like, it could be the coach, it could be the ref. And that's actually, we've experimented a little bit with both. And it also could be the parents, although we've actually focused more on the coaches and the refs. Next slide. So what are pregame safety huddles? Well, the idea is this is really simple, really quick, less than a minute. Um, and that the, you know, it's reviewing some of the things that could happen on the field. So like, what is a concussion? Well, if you get it in the head and you have a headache or you feel dizzy or you're a little out of it, that could be a concussion. And if you, if you keep playing, you could be worse and it's going to take you longer to come uh, to get better and to get back in the field. So let's make sure we take you out and we get you assessed. And we want to know, we want to know if you're injured. Um, and so this is like, we, you know, we, um, next slide. You know, as I said, we were really partnering with all these uh, stakeholders. We're working um, both in Seattle and actually in Georgia, because we also really felt deeply that you have to think about all of the different places this is going to happen. Um, and so we developed these like really short cards and we wanted coaches to adapt this. We actually made these videos, which is really there's a whole website and stuff I can send people if you're interested. Um, and then we had coaches kind of practice this and like the people would adapt it in different ways. And so some coaches would do sort of a call and response with the kids. And this was really, we got this down to where it was like 30 seconds a minute before the game. Next slide. And then we said, well, let's do the randomized study. So because I'm a researcher, that's what I do is like, does this really work? Um, so we randomized, we basically had to randomize a whole league to huddles, yes or no. Um, and we ended up with 300 athletes that were in this sample, um, and which sounds like a big number. But when we're thinking about things like uh, concussion, we actually ended up right the outcome we looked at was like, if you were to get hit in the head, would you tell someone? Um, what's really exciting is that we found it, we found a difference with this is still not a, a not a huge sample so we were really excited to say wow we, we can make a difference even with just you know 300 kids and so next slide so our next step is that we really want to bring this to the bigger national stage and say like does this change behavior so if if we do this if we reinforce right before the game we want to know if you're injured um does that mean that kids are more likely to report does that mean that we're getting kids out sooner that they're getting you know appropriately treated and then getting back in a much sooner um uh, so that we're feeling good about, about what's happening on the field. So um, more to come, uh, putting in some grants, thinking more about the next steps, but, but hopefully partnering with U.S. Soccer to, to make this happen and make this really feel, you know, our goal too, as I, as I mentioned, we started with concussion, but as we did this, we realized, you know, you can talk about anything. So at the beginning of the game, you know, it's a hot day, as we talked about. That's another, another thing that in that two seconds, you can mention it's a hot day, take a break. Um, so there's all of these things that I think this could really evolve to be this sort of pregame safety check. -in. Thanks, Dr. Chrisman. I think what, what I will share with everyone and I'll work with Caitlin and Melissa is we think the pregame safety huddles is something that we'd like to look into deeper across our membership. And so what we'll do is we'll work, we'll work with our member associations, the clubs, the coaches to see if we can potentially go deeper than 300 athletes. Um, so we'll follow up with everyone. Um, and if you're interested, please email Caitlin and or Melissa, um, and then we can follow up with you. We do think that, again, taking 30 seconds or a minute with the referee, with both coaches and the players to discuss about this pregame safety huddle will make a difference. Players are going to be more likely to look out for themselves, look out for each other, and then ultimately make our game safer. So more to come with regards to this uh, as we look at this, working with the CDC um, and our partners at Seattle Children's and others across the United States is a, is a way that we think we can make our, our game safer. So Dr. Chrisman, thank you so much for your presentation. So much, and we look forward to working closer with you. Same. Same. Very exciting. So the last piece for tonight, um, and it should only take a couple of minutes. And again, you will all have access to this. Um, so please do not feel like we need to rush through this, but we will make sure everyone has access. Uh, ben Roper from Stryker is here with us. We've had a lot of conversations on how we can put, be able to support our members. Uh, we talked about sudden cardiac arrest and AEDs. Uh, it is something we know that has some cost to it, 
but because of uh, our relationship with Striker and being able to use our platform, we want to make sure we take advantage of it and be able to support our members. So with that, uh, Ben, if you can maybe take us through a couple minutes of the uh, possibilities that clubs can have uh, on getting access to AEDs. Thank you for that, Dr. Champis. And I would say that your video on CPR and AED use is one of the best that I have seen in the industry. I would encourage everybody listening to make sure that their teams are familiar with it. Um, sudden cardiac arrest has increased substantially since the COVID pandemic. And while we're dealing with a lot of young teams, there are a lot of parents and other people in and around those fields. We had a couple, a couple high class uh, events last year, one with Christian Erickson on a professional field. And then one of our coworkers in the Seattle area, her husband actually suffered a, a cardiac arrest on a soccer field and was luckily saved by an AED at the school, the field that they were playing at. So it, it is an event while it is scary. If we have the right tools and we react in the right way, it is a very survivable event. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as Dr. Chimpis mentioned, we have entered into an agreement where we are giving heavily discounted AEDs to uh, members of US soccer to try and help them adopt or at least have a compatible and a pediatric ready AED available to save a life in the event that they do have uh, an arrest. You've got two different options on the screen. One is our most advanced and most technologically um, adaptable AED. It has a new function called CPR Insight that allows you to do continuous compressions while uh, the device is analyzing that heart rhythm. But it does have a single button pediatric code uh, that attenuates that energy level down to a pediatric patient. It can be connected via Wi-Fi uh, and use multiple languages. So it's a very advanced AED. We're seeing it deployed all over the country and it's doing a phenomenal job of saving lives. Our other option is a semi-automatic option, meaning we just need to press a button when it is ready to deliver energy. And that is our HeartSign 350P. It is extremely durable, extremely lightweight. It also comes with an optional pediatric pad that you can insert to make it pediatric compatible. Both devices come with a four-year battery and electrode. So we like to keep those maintenance costs down and really focus on why you have the AED, which is the opportunity to save a life. Um, the agreement that we've entered in with U.S. Soccer is actually helping take some of these proceeds and funds from the sale of these AEDs that we're going to give back to U.S. Soccer so that they can donate AEDs into underserved communities or clubs that won't have the ability to get an AED on their own. So we really just want to see a safer space uh, and more awareness around what to do. I thought Dr. Churchill did a phenomenal job talking about sudden cardiac arrest and the things that we need to do to be aware and respond in those events. With that being said, I'm gonna pass it over to my good friend, Hannah, so she can describe how you can access uh, this special offer that we have. Thanks, Ben. Hey, everyone, I wanna share, this is our Striker team dedicated to support you in saving more lives. You can scan the QR code that is up on the screen and it will actually populate an email over to our good friend, Chris Manning, for you to reach out to him about special pricing for US soccer. We really want you um, and your surrounding clubs to take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, we really thank you and look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks, Anna. And thank you for inviting us. This was just a, a phenomenal panel uh, of, of healthcare professionals, doctor. I, I thought it was just a really tremendous, um, tremendous event. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Ben. And thank you, Hannah, so much. We will make sure that um, we send out that uh, QR code across our membership. Um, our goal is to be uh, facilitators for our game and keeping our players safe. I want to thank everyone for being on the panel. Before everyone um, leaves, um, I want to bring up two quick points. U.S. Soccer is working to create a preferred provider list across the country. We will be working with uh, Major League Soccer, NWSL, USL, NISA, and our member associations to see if we can create um, a healthcare network across the country, across disciplines, orthopedics, primary care, sports medicine, mental health, uh, uh, neuro neuropsychologists for concussions, so on. 
uh, so that when you go to recognize to recover or to our US soccer platform and you're anywhere in the country, you can identify healthcare professionals that take care of soccer athletes uh, uh, across the country. So more to come on that. We hope to have that by the end of the year. Uh, I just wanted to share that with everyone. I also want to thank our speakers, uh, incredible expertise. Uh, it's the first time we're doing this to service our members, and we're excited to do even more in our sports medicine and our sports performance space. And lastly, I want to thank Caitlin uh, and Melissa for your uh, incredible assistance on this and bringing all of our um, uh, clubs, our coaches, uh, and our game together tonight. Thank you so much on behalf of U.S. Soccer. Have a great night, a safe season. Uh, and as always, we are here to support you in every aspect. Thank you and have a great night. Caitlin. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you hanging out with us uh, for our, our bonus hour. Um, and, uh, and with that, we'll, we'll get this up um, on our website soon and let all of our members uh, know that the, where and where that information is located. But um, just everyone uh, have a good night and I'll, I'll echo what, um, what George said. Let's, uh, let's have a great season, everyone. Bye now. Good night.